Unfound is a podcast that just turned three years old a week ago. It has an interview-based format and concentrates on the facts, not the theories. Today, and for the third time, I will take you back to the beginning, then right up to the present, as I cover new updates on many of Unfound's cases. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. In the last update episode, which came out in April of this year, 2019, I talked about what we leave behind. That was the topic because in 2018, I conducted some severe introspection after both my birth mother and my real mother died. I've started to question what I'm leaving behind on this earth and how I can use Unfound to make my guests' lives better. Today, for the next minute and a half, I want to talk about the present not the future or the past. Right here, right now, in September 2019, I want to make an impassioned plea to the rest of the true crime community. The plagiarism and shortcutting and copying and pasting and stealing of other people's work must stop. Now. I realize you want fame and fortune and likes and shares and downloads and TV shows and documentaries and your very own personal Wikipedia page but to get there by using others, by lying to your audience about the work you allegedly do, by using crime as the punchline for jokes, by using the misfortune of others to further your career without giving something back to every single one of these people, is wrong. Podcasts are a magnificent tool. They can be listened to everywhere. They can be taken everywhere. They take up very little space on any mobile device. Anyone can create one. Podcasting is a device for change. It's the future. Yet many people in true crime use it as if they're reading an encyclopedia from 1982. We can change these people's lives who have been harmed. And that should mean more than our own personal fame and fortune. And to the podcast companies, maybe you'll learn your lesson when you get hit in your pocketbook from a civil suit due to you employing the kinds of people I'm talking about. And don't tell me you don't realize what these hosts are doing. Come on now. And now summary of Unfound. And no, you will not find this on my friend Megan Good's website, charlieproject.org. Unfound was born out of the idea that the public should know as much as it can about missing persons cases. I, as the host, go about getting you all the facts I can by interviewing those people who are closest to the case, usually family members. However, we've also had bloggers, reporters, and private investigators on the program, but only one official law enforcement member, Detective Kenneth Maines. Why only one? Frankly, because cops, although they know a lot, they never want to tell you anything. And unlike many programs that splice in the host's questions and comments after, Unfound plays every interview as it was recorded, minus the mistakes. The interviews are played in this manner because I believe you, the listeners, need to be reassured that nothing is taken out of context and that you are listening to a conversation like any two people might have. The first call I ever made representing myself as the host of Unfound was to Mary Lyle, mother of Suzanne Lyle. The call happened sometime in late July 2016. I was at my parents' place in Pennsylvania. I can remember standing in their bedroom with the door shut for privacy when I made the call. That's a true story. She surely had no idea who I was, and at that point I had no history of ever interviewing anybody. I can kind of rely on my extensive resume now. But at the time, I was just a guy on the other end of the phone line. I was very nervous. However, Mary couldn't have been friendlier, and I would say these days we talk about once every two months, and she has been very supportive of Unfound, I can't even begin to tell you, sending several future guests my way. I hope to meet her in person sometime soon. 
That conversation was followed by a call to Patrick Marker, the guest for the Joshua Guimond episode, then Tim Wright for the Ben Charles Padilla episode. And before I knew it, Unfound had gained some momentum. Probably the next big thing that happened for Unfound that pushed it forward was a listener kind of becoming my right-hand woman to find guests for the program. Emily, you've heard me mention her many times before, is responsible for finding probably half the guests you've heard on Unfound since May of 2017. Her passion and compassion make her excellent at what she does. She stays in contact with guests even after they've been on the program. Then, in December 2017, Unfound became linked with the Tribune Review in Pittsburgh. It carried Unfound on its website throughout 2018, and I helped them cover older missing persons cases in western Pennsylvania through monthly articles. Along the way, Unfound has picked up Cherie, researcher and overseer of both the Unfound live show on YouTube and the newest creation, the Unfound Think Tank, on Patreon. Carrie and Heather, administrators for the discussion group on Facebook. Eric, a personal confidant and independent researcher. And most recently, Kayla, who will be taking over some of the work I do for the website, speaking engagements, and merchandise. There have been books and newsletters and t-shirts and poll questions, and most importantly, the respect and concern all of you continue to show for Unfound's many, many guests. Like the first and second update episodes from the summer of 2018 and April of 2019, I will be doing all the talking today. I'm Ed Denzel. I'm from Leechburg, Pennsylvania. I attended Grove City College, class of 93. I graduated with a degree in business that I've never had to use. I've had all sorts of odd jobs, including magic show stage manager, printer and fax machine technician, Department of Transportation flag person, model, and Star Trek actor. I lived in Las Vegas from 1998 to 2011, Madeira Beach, Florida from 2011 to 2019, and now I live in Clearwater Beach. But Vegas is still my favorite city. Unfound news. Actually, there is no news for this week. Because I had to record this episode so far in advance because I was going to Canada, I couldn't predict what the news would be. So you'll just have to wait for next week. So that takes me to where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on Podomatic, iTunes, Stitcher, Instagram, Twitter, Spotify, and Facebook. On Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, please join us on YouTube for the Unfound live show. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. You can also contribute at PayPal, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. That is also the email address. Merchandise. The books at amazon.com in both ebook and print form. Do not forget the reviews. Shirts at unfound podcast.myshopify.com. Poker playing cards at makeplayingcards.com forward slash sell forward slash unfound podcast. And please mention unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. Before I start going through all of these updates, I want to assure everyone that just because I am mentioning a certain case does not mean I believe unfound has something to do with the new information. If I believe that to be a fact for a certain case, I will say so. Also, Unfound does not scoop or plagiarize other people's work. So in some of these cases, there's work being done. I know what the work is. I know the progress being made. But I will allow the people who are actually doing the work to reveal their new information when they are good and ready. Okay, let's get started. If you are unfamiliar with how I do this, uh, do these update episodes, uh, this will be my third one. I do not type out some long, 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 long script. I mean, we have a lot of cases to cover in this episode, and I anticipate that this episode is going to be, what, two and a half hours long, something like that. Uh, what I do is I go down through um, all of the cases that I believe have updates, and I will do a little Google searching. I may contact a few of the guests uh, for some episodes just to see if there are any updates. 
because I have to admit, I kind of do keep up on this stuff. Not It's hard to with 140 cases now, but I really do try to keep in touch with my guests and they know if anything uh, pops up that um, they can contact me. So I will go through and what I will do is I will write down the names of the cases that I'm going to cover into my computer and, and I will just jot down some notes so there's no script. So you're going to hear some ums and you knows and maybe some long pauses and things. Uh, that's just the way it is because if I had to type out a script to read from, it would take hours and hours and hours. So this is how I do it. Every time these update episodes seem to be very, very popular, so I'm going to just keep doing them this way. So let's get started. The first case uh, that I'm going to be covering is Teresa Butler's. About a month after the last update episode, which was in April of 2019, police in the area, I believe this was local, this, these were local officials and state officials, raided or served a warrant or something like that on a house on 2nd Street in Tallapoosa, Missouri. That's T-A-L-L-A-P-O-O-S-A. And this uh, house, this town, this very, very tiny town of like dirt roads, dirt streets, is about four miles south of Risco. Once again, uh, this was back in mid-May. There has not been any public news really since then. However, at the time, it got quite a bit of coverage. In fact, local TV uh, was there. Uh, there are a couple reporters on the scene uh, broadcasting from the area. They seem to be taking pieces of the house out of the house. So like floorboards or pieces of a wall. I don't know if this house has a basement, but that look to be what they were doing. And I think they spent uh, a day there. I don't think it was multiple days, um, but it was at least, I think one full day where they were going in there and taking things out. As far as we could tell the video that I saw, once again, it wasn't like objects. It wasn't like, um, you know, a piece of furniture or anything like that. It looked to be pieces. Like I said, like a floorboard, something like that. Now, what is the significance of this house? We don't know. Uh, there has been no news on this, once again, since mid-May, and I'm doing this episode um, in later August, late August of 2019. So it's been, let's see, to mid-June, to mid-July, to mid-August, it's been three and a half months, and no word since uh, they were there. This house used to be owned by Melvin Hufford, H-U-F-F-O-R-D. Now, I have heard this name before, and it's one of many, many names uh, that, it's, that pop up once in a while in connection with Teresa's disappearance, but I do not believe it, it is this guy that they are looking at. I don't think he lives there anymore or even owns the house anymore. I think that they were looking at his son who could possibly be involved in Teresa's disappearance. Uh, this is his house once again, though. So far, as far as the public knows, nothing has come of this. Now, I don't know if it was in the last update that I did in April, or maybe the one before that. You will remember that um, I talked about how a camera had been found not long after Teresa disappeared. That was something that they didn't release until within the last year. And then at some point, maybe in early 2018, something like that, they were doing some digging near where Teresa lived a few miles away that, of course, turned up nothing. So it seems to me that the police are trying to do something about this. When they get uh, a tip that they think is believable, it seems to me that they are acting on it. However, I, did, I have to tell you that being that it's been three and a half months and nothing has come from... Uh, what they did in May, it, it does seem like this could be another uh, dead end in this case. But since the last update, that's what went on. Uh, police went to a house on 2nd Street in Tallapoosa, Missouri. Uh, media, local media found out that this was connected to the investigation into Teresa. Uh, 
Teresa Butler's disappearance. They took various items out of the house. What I saw were pieces of the house, and that has really been uh, the last word on that. And once again, this is a house that I believe back in 2006, I don't have the date written down here, 2006, uh, who owned it was this guy, Melvin Hufford, H-U-F-F-O-R-D, and I guess you can look him up if you would like. The next case I'm going to talk about is Peggy and Patty McDaniel. Now, I can't tell you everything about this case, um, but I can tell you about what I even have in my notes is an unbelievable development in this case. Uh, must have been June, maybe. I was talking to Joyce, and she told me that she had got something, gotten something in the mail from Broward County. And they've been looking for, through their records, uh, anything that they can find on any investigation that they did on Peggy and Patty's disappearance, of course, back in 1979. They didn't send her the actual paperwork that they found, but they sent her like, a, I wouldn't call it a form letter, but um, it just kind of detailing what they did. Well, the weird part is that in their records, they do not have, well, I don't even want to put this. They don't have in their records just the simple names Peggy McDaniel. Let me say that again. Peggy McDaniel and Patty McDaniel. In their records, they have another last name added to the end of their names. Yes, really. I'm not going to tell you what the name is. But... So their disappearance, of course, is going to be 40 years old um, this coming month in September. And Joyce had never heard this before. It's And the thing is, it's not a last name. It's So it'd be like Peggy McDaniel Smith or Patty McDaniel Smith. It's not Smith. It's something else. That is how down, in, I guess, in Broward County, they have these girls' names written in their records. Now, the weird thing is that, and it's not a last name like Smith or Brown or Johnson, it's it's not as rare as Denzel, but it's somewhere in between. Joyce has no one in her family with that last name, and her ex-husband, Peggy and Patty's father, has no one in his, la his family with that, that last name. So, even to this point now in August, we have no idea where that last name came from. Now, when she told me that that day, and she has it in, in, in this letter, it's not something somebody told her. This is in some official paperwork that was sent to her. Once again, she's never heard this before, 40 years. So I really got a bug up my butt about this, and I was in a mood. So what did I do? I called the guy who, well, I'll get into that. Um, the guy that we believed was responsible for the investigation into Pat, Peggy and Patty McDaniel's disappearance back in 1979. His name is Ed Madge. I got on the computer, found his phone number, called him. Something probably I should have done a while ago. Called him. I think his wife answered the phone. He came to the phone. Now, he's an old guy now. It's been 40 years. He, I, I think he's in his late 70s now. He's just a few years younger than my dad is. I think Ed Madge is like 78 years old. I told him who I was. I introduced myself, told him about the program, told him what I do. And he, this is going to probably shock all of you. He didn't even, and, and I, if he gets to hear this, this is not a criticism. I'm just stating the facts, okay? I, if he hears this and gets upset, I apologize, but I think all of you deserve to know. He didn't even remember the case. Now, this was not a guy, I, I've talked to him twice now. I realize that he's 78 years old, but in no way did he come across as a person who is losing his memory or anything. It seemed quite sharp to me. 
But he did not remember the disappearance at all. He didn't remember their names at all. And then once we started going through the timeline and everything, um, he was confused on even how he could have been involved in anything regarding the disappearance because at the time in 1979, although he was a police officer in the area, he would not have been responsible for what Joyce and I thought he was, of course, Joyce being from the beginning, Joyce thought he was responsible for back in late 1979 into 80, 81, 82. So his recollection of his own service history in that area as a police officer is different than how Joyce remembered it. Even telling him Joyce's name, now I don't, know if she was Joyce Rivetuzo at the time. I don't think we've ever talked about that, but that's a fairly unique name. Didn't remember. Even though Joyce had talked to, to Ed a few times back then about Peggy and Patty McDaniels, her daughter's disappearances. So I gave him a bunch of information. I gave him a link to uh, the episode, so he could listen to the interview that I did with Joyce back in April, March, April of 2017. And he said that I'm going to try to, and I even told him about the murder that's connected to it. He said, you know what, that kind of reminds me, but it really does not jump out at me at all. So we had a conversation, I'm going to say half hour, 40 minutes, something like that. It was a cordial conversation. It was a little frustrating given that he really didn't remember he didn't remember Joyce, didn't remember Patty, didn't remember Peggy, didn't remember the paperwork, nothing. But the good thing is, a few weeks later, he did call me back and talk to um, some other people that he worked with at the time, really trying to narrow this down and, and everything. And he says that he did remember a, a case now of a murdered man being found in the trunk of his car. Of course, that's the guy that's connected to Peggy and Patty McDaniel's disappearance. But he says, I have no recollection at all that a disappearance was ever connected to it at all. Moreover, uh, I did tell him about this additional last name that was on the paperwork that Joyce got. He said, well, that, la that last name does mean something to me because there are people, there's a family in the area down there in Broward County who have a very bad reputation and that is their last name. And it, it like I said, it's not Smith or Johnson or anything like that for it's, it's a rare enough last name that uh, it, it probably is not a coincidence that their name got attached to Peggy and Patty's case and got added, but nobody knows why it got added on. This is real. I'm not making this up. This is real. And even uh, Ed Madge himself, he goes, I, I really don't know what to tell you. Uh, it's, I don't know. And he started talking about the guy, uh, men, uh, officers who would be, re who would have probably been responsible for it. And he gave me one name. And unfortunately, that guy passed away many, many years ago, like 2000, something like that. And Ed said that he talked to some other guy, some other police officer that was, uh, might have been responsible for it. He didn't remember their disappearance either. It's very, very sad. It's very sad. And I'm not trying to criti criticize Ed Madge, okay? I, 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 I'm sure I just came completely out of nowhere. I'm sure that in his everyday la life, he doesn't get asked about anything that he did in, as a police officer 40 years ago. Okay, I get that. But I think what it shows is this just shows how these disappearances can get swept under the rug and forgotten and everything else if people aren't keeping up on it. And not just the family, but people outside of the family, reporters, the public, the public that's not related to Peggy and Patty McDaniel. Uh, as of the recording of this, we're still trying to figure all of this out. I haven't talked to Ed Madge probably in a month. I think he did call me maybe a month ago. Like I said, I talked to him in June, or I found out in June, talked to him, and then he called me back just like I said, and I deeply appreciated that. But unfortunately, he wasn't a ton of help. 
even though Joyce claims that he sh she talked to in person this guy Ed Madge a few times back then uh, you know in the early 80s what's also a little hard to understand is if you go back if you go to newspapers.com and you go back to that time of 81 Ed Madge is quoted in articles about their disappearance but what he said was I was not the guy you know, I was like you know he was like the sergeant or whatever and there were people working under him on it I was not on the ground trying to figure out what happened to these girls. I know that I'm quoted in the articles, but I was not the one actually working on the case. And maybe that's the reason that I just don't remember it. I just don't. And he, I, I know he feels bad about that. Uh, it was, it's very strange. So we got this last name that it's, that's attached to Peggy and Patty's McDaniels case. So like I said, it would be something like Peggy McDaniel Smith. Patty McDaniel Smith, and once again, this last name that's added on is also the last name of a family, a large family down in the Broward County area who have a very surly reputation, have had that reputation for many years going back to the 1970s. So at this point, we still have no idea what to make of it. Next, Esther Westenbarger. This past June 8th, they had the fourth annual Keeping Their Memory Alive uh, at the Milwaukee Iron Clubhouse at 111 East Monroe Street. And the benefits go to the Q Center. And that all sounds very well and good. However, the person who continues to organize this, and I've, I've written about this, I wrote about this in the book, that contains Esther Westenbarger's disappearance. I believe that is volume four or five from season one. I'm thinking it's volume five of season one of the Unfound Book series. I wrote about how Bill Pelfrey, her brother, continues to be the main um, leader in publicizing Esther's uh, disappearance. And I have talked to Esther's daughter, about this, Matilda, but I will leave those conversations uh, off the record. But somebody at the Q Center, Q Center, you have, the CUE Center, you have a very, very good reputation, okay? You should not be taking any proceeds from anything that Bill Pelfrey organizes, okay? Periods, just nothing. I don't care if it's $1. I don't care if it's $10,000. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, you really should look into his background. You should look into the interview that I did with Esther's daughter, Matilda, once again, not just who I just mentioned, about Bill's history, his history with, with Esther, which was not good. And all of the circumstances surrounding Esther's disappearance in which he could be considered a person of interest in this case. And now there are others. But at the time of Esther's disappearance, um, let's just put it this way. Bill Pelfrey is no saint. You can look his record up. You know, and I've heard the stories about how he organized these, these searches. Go over here, don't go over there. I've heard about them. But I, I don't know how many people really realize that, that are getting involved in this event. He shouldn't be running it. He shouldn't be. I don't know what I can personally do about that from Florida, but I do know that the Q Center, once again, with its excellent reputation, should know who is raising money for them. The next case, Craig Freer. Uh, this is really just a uh, continuation of an update that I did in the last update show that uh, there's a private investigator who has a group of people uh, that continue to look into Craig's disappearance. And, and actually, just recently, Craig's cousin uh, contacted me, but we have not had a chance to speak yet. 
once again, it's not a, a brother of Craig. It's a cousin of Craig. And I'm um, just going to leave it at that. But he would like to talk to me. Uh, I think it's going to be a very positive conversation. I think that, uh, let's just put it this way. I think he has some concerns about the disappearance. I, I don't get the feeling that uh, he thinks Craig just ran off. Let's put it that way. No names of it. I, like I said, I've not had an in-depth conversation. He contacted me, wanted to talk. I got back to him, and we just haven't been able to get together on a time yet. But I will be interested to talk to Craig's cousin when that happens. Maybe it will happen in the next few days, although I'm very busy right now. i got to get a lot of stuff done uh, before I go to Orlando, then go to Canada. But I hope to talk to him, but there are people in not maybe law inv- law enforcement, but private people who who continue to try to dig up as much as they can about this disappearance. And I'm sure when they have something to release to the public, they will do that. I'm sure that they will let me know about it. And if there is anything that I can pass on to the public regarding my conversation with Craig's cousin, I will do so. Of course, that will be up to me and him whether, uh, you know, determining how much is public and how much should remain off the record. I, I really don't know. I don't know what kind of conversation that's going to be about all of that until I actually talk to the guy. But um, it's just a continuation that there are private people who continue to work on uh, Craig's case, and I'm looking forward to talking to uh, Craig's cousin, uh at a time that that is good for both of us. Next, I don't think that we have talked about uh, this case before on an update uh, episode, uh, but we're going to do it now. Pamela Golden, a woman, um, I'm thinking it's a woman, Shannon Darter, Shannon can be a guy's name, right? Uh, But I think it's a woman left this message on the Podomatic page. This was not a message that was sent to me privately on Facebook or email. This is a message that is still on the Podomatic page for Unfound under uh, the Pamela Golden episode. I will read it to you exactly as it is written. This interview has so much false, false information in it, I can't believe they take a person's... Uh, a person's story, family or not, and put that information out there with having false information. I hope they have heard of the term defamation because this is exactly what this interview consists consist of. Rita has put the names has put names out there and information that she that she's not even sure of. If you listen to this interview, she says it several times. How can you sit there and give so much false information about people? Now you should know I don't get a ton of emails and messages like this. As you know, I've had some people that were not too pleased with the coverage uh, that Unfound gave on on this case or that case. And some of my guests have gotten blowback within their own families or outside their families for what they say, they've said on Unfound. But here's what I know. This is kind of my rule after three, uh, you know, just about three years of doing this program. If somebody emails me, and says that interview was nothing but a bunch of lies, but then doesn't tell me what those lies are, then I realize this person's just blowing off steam or is just uh, embarrassed or whatever else. This, if you're, just a note for anybody. If you ever want to email me and tell me that an interview I did with somebody was full of lies, then please take the time to tell me what those lies are in your message. Okay. Then we can talk about it. If you, but if you're just going to tell me it's nothing but a a bunch of lies and that's it, I'm not responding. However, if you tell me that so-and-so never said that, and here's how I know and everything, then we can have a conversation. But you would be amazed. I don't know how much has happened. Maybe one every 10 episodes, 10 cases, something like that. I will get an email from somebody saying, oh, that's nothing but a bunch of lies. Some family member, some, you know, who knows? You know, just... But they never detail what those lies are. You don't know how much that happens. Um, and I think, uh, so 
what I do in these cases is I immediately contact the guest for that episode. In this case, it was Pamela's sister, Rita, who was the guest way back in 2017. And she believes that Shannon Darter is someone that was related to the guy who was mentioned in that episode, and his name is Robert McIntosh. And if you remember, I'm not going to go all over all the details of the case, but allegedly Pamela was supposed to go over and help Robert McIntosh's wife move out because she was divorcing Robert. And the claim is that Pamela never reached their house, and of course she disappeared. Her truck was found down the street from Rita's uh, flower shop where Pamela was working that day like, a few days later. Um, the, the weird part is that Robert McIntosh's wife never left them, and they're, they're still married to this day. And, of course, Pamela Golden's disappearance, it's, it's one of the older ones that uh, Unfound is covered. So she was allegedly going to leave her husband Robert that day, but then didn't, and they're still married to this day. That's a fact. Um, but I will just read this to you, uh, read the message to you again before I finish uh, this section on Pamela, if you'd like uh, to hear it again. And like I said, it's typed out. The English is not that great. I try to make corrections so it's a little more understandable. This interview has so much false information in it, I can't believe they take a person, story, family, or not and put that information out there with false information. I hope they have heard of the term defamation because this is exactly what this interview consists, consists of. Rita has put names out there and information that she's not even sure of. If you listen to this interview, she says it several times. How can you sit there and give so much false information about people? First of all, and this is something that I get asked a little bit about the defamation okay actually at least in the united states to get to the level of defamation you have to go pretty 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 far to get something that is into court first of all regarding this particular case there's nothing against the law to state where pamela was going that day that's how robert mcintosh's name gets into this in the first place that's where she was going Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there were some other things going on in Pamela's case that, once again, I don't want to get into all the details, but that is why Robert McIntosh's name got into this in the first place. Now, as far as defamation goes, first of all, it's not enough, and we don't lie on Unfound, but just because you lie about somebody does not mean that it's defamation. The standard for defamation generally in the United States, and it varies from maybe from state to state, but it's pretty close to this. The person who claims that he or she is defamed must first prove, it's up to them to prove that the lies were committed. So they have to prove that the stuff was lies. They were lies. They just can't say they're lies. They have to be able to prove that whatever a person said is a lie. Second of all, they have to prove that that lie damaged them in some way. It's not enough to say, well, it hurts my feelings. The person has to be able to say, well, I lost my job. I lost business. I got divorced. Uh, my reputation was harmed in some way that cost me something. It has to be something tangible. It's just not, you hurt my feelings. And then even on top of that, there could even be other standards and like I said, from country to country, it's different. Of course, in the United States, we have freedom of speech, so our defamation laws are quite loose. Um, you have to go quite a bit. And on top of everything else, and this is the other stand, this is the other point, the person who brings the suit must prove that whoever lied about them did it maliciously. And so when they were saying these things, they knew the lies that they were telling. And they were lying on purpose to hurt that person. Like I said, it's a very, very high hurdle to jump to win a defamation suit, at least in the United States. I personally don't think we've defamed anybody on Unfound at all. We don't go after people. We just state, this is the person that last saw them. This is the, the, the man or woman who was dating them. Uh, and this person has a record and... And what do I always say? I can't help it that the facts about these people sometimes make them look guilty. I can't help that. 
all right? That doesn't mean they did anything. But this is the information, and it's up to the listeners to decide for themselves. So that is an update with Pamela Golden's case, and it's nice to be able to include uh, her case and her in this uh, update episode. Next one, Chip Campbell. I think he has been, I think, in every update episode uh, so far, and I guess that would make sense being that uh, his case is one of the newer ones uh, that Unfound covered. In fact, at the time when we covered it in the summer of 2017, his disappearance was just a year and a few months old. Uh, I forget when this was. Must have, it seems like yesterday. It must have been June that I met with Chip's entire family. To this point, I had only met uh, a couple of his sisters. But this time I got to meet, uh, what was it, four sisters? And we met at a Sweet Tomatoes up there on Route 19, and their significant others were there. And I didn't know it, but uh, his one sister, Laura, uh, made a painting for me that you can now see in the background when I do the live shows on, on Wednesday nights. It's the big one. Of course, there's one that's over my, of course, on the right side of the screen is the unfound uh, one that Heather made for me. And then on the other wall, the far wall, is a, it's a pretty large painting of a lighthouse uh, with a beam coming out of it, a, a beam of light, and in that beam of light it says unfound. Uh, Chip's sister, Laura, made it for me. It's beautiful. She's very, very talented. And um, so I got to meet them for the first time. Of course, I've talked about Lisa Kassoon, who was the guest for that episode. I also got to meet um, one of the Donnas. I forget which one now. Yes, and there are, are two Donnas. Chip has two sisters named Donna. Go it's pretty cool. Like my brother Daryl and my other brother Daryl. But from uh, what was the Bob Newhart show, right? Newhart, whatever it was called. Uh, but we had a really good time. Uh, I was totally surprised uh, by this very, very uh, gracious gift. And we did it right there in Sweet Tomatoes. All these people were staring at us like, you know, what's going on here? But we had a really good time. It was a pleasure to meet all of them. Uh, I don't know, really know how much otherwise is going on in Chip's case. Tanya, of course, his roommate, uh, the girl that I think Chip kind of liked at the time. It might have, you know, might have been uh, what got him eventually into the trouble that he got into. Uh, is still in jail. I don't think she's on the run again. Finally, uh, another time. But I don't really know how much progress has been made. But I know that the Chip Campbell's family um, are very engaged. Uh, with this, and you know, I have to believe that eventually this is this disappearance, Chip's disappearance, is going to be solved. There's just too many people um, that get into trouble, that loose lips sink ships, and I think that's eventually going to happen. I just don't know uh, when it'll be, but I, I do believe that it will eventually get solved. I just don't know when. The next case, Flight 370. Now, the Flight 370 is not a case that I included in any of the books. The best books on Flight 370 are already written. They're written by my friend Jeff Wise, who, to me, is the nationwide international expert on this disappearance, even though I realize that some of his theories aren't in the mainstream. Well, you know what? I believe him, and so I guess my theories aren't in the mainstream either. But I did not include uh, this uh, disappearance of all these people on this on this jet in the Unfound series because, you know, I didn't because the book already came out. It would have been in this most. It would have been in the last um, book for season one, so volume six of season one. If it was going to be in anything, it would have been in there. It was two reasons. One, I think that Unfound has become a more personal program. Uh, I think that the listeners want more of the personal stories and uh, hearing from a family member that, you know, just, you know, one or two people who went missing. I think that's part of it. And you should know, even though the, the YouTube video 
that I eventually put together for Flight 370 is one of the most watched of all of Unfound's videos on YouTube. You should know that Flight 370 is not even close to one of the most popular episodes that Unfound ever done as far as being downloaded. It's weird. It's weird how that works. Like it works like that. But uh, Flight 370, I don't even think is in the top 20 of the most downloaded episodes of Unfound. 140 episodes, not even in the top 20. Uh, but the YouTube video is very, 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 very popular. Maybe even you know number one. I. I why that is, I, I suppose I'd have to think about it a little bit. But I also didn't want anybody to get the idea that, that I'm trying to piggyback on the popularity of Flight 370 and everything and put it in a book to sell more books. Okay, I also uh, was thinking about that. Uh, you know, if I put it in there, then I got the feeling, well, people are going to think that I only put it in there because, you know, it's so popular internationally. And so I could sell more books, and even though it's a case that I legitimately covered. I had the foremost expert on the disappearance on the program. I kind of just thought, you know, um, Jeff is doing a fine job with the two books that he's written on it. He continues to write about uh, the disappearance. And I think that that's plenty. And I think that's why I left it uh, out of volume six of season one. But the reason I'm talking about it here is there was a major article by William Langewish, L-A-N-G-E-W-I-E-S-C-H-E. He's a very knowledgeable guy, very, very uh, well-known in the av aviation community, and he wrote an article for The Atlantic about F Flight 370. And I... I don't know how much I can say about this, but I have talked to Jeff since this article came out and it came out, like I said, it maybe came out in June, it came out once again, since the last update episode in April, 2019, that even though this guy, uh, William L, I'm not going to try to uh, embarrass myself and pronounce his name again, uh, is a very knowledgeable guy. I think that he makes the same mistakes that most people have made. He has some very good theories. The problem is, is that he conveniently leaves things out to make his theory work. It's like he came up with what he believes happened and then tries to make the facts fit his theory. And Jeff uh, responded to this article on his own site, jeffwise.net, which I would recommend all of you go to, not just about Flight 370, really some really interesting uh, discussion there about um, all sorts of different things bes uh, besides Flight 370. But um, that article came out, Jeff responded, and here's what I know. I, I know that I'm glad I'm on Jeff's side when it comes to this because I surely would not want to have to argue with him about it because he knows his stuff. Absolutely 100% knows his stuff. And I would love to see... Uh, if they would ever put something together, uh, Jeff debate uh, some other person in the aviation community uh, about the disappearance of Flight 370. And if you're unfamiliar with um, what Jeff believes, Jeff believes that the, the jet was hijacked and the signals from the jet were spoofed and that the jet ended up in uh, Kazakhstan, I think it is. Um, and he has um, reasons to believe that. And he believes that all of these parts and things that were found in uh, Madagascar and uh, Eastern Africa are all planted. I know, big conspiracy theory, but there is scientific evidence to support what Jeff thinks, and that's the exact reason he, he thinks the way he does. And I am a along those lines. I think there's still a lot of things that need to be explained that I don't quite get into that Jeff does believe. But I do believe, like he does, that the the information that was going to that satellite from the jet was was faked. I do believe that. So uh, maybe you want to check that article out anyway. It's by William Langowish uh, at theatlantic.com regarding the disappearance of Flight 370. Next case, April Pitzer. I don't know if we talked about her case in the last episode, the up, last update episode, but I'm really sure we did it in the first episode. But just recently, within the last six weeks maybe, 
maybe since um, middle of July. And this was public, so I don't think that I'm speaking out of school. Her mother, Gloria, had issued a request. She needed somebody in Southern California to uh, maybe a private investigator or somebody like that to go and talk to a couple people. I don't know what this uh, it concerns. I've not had any in-depth conversations with Gloria, although I did send her uh, uh, a book uh, with April's uh, episode in it, her case in it. That was uh, volume six of season one. I've not, but what I did do is uh, I let Caroline Lowe uh, know about this because she lives in Northern California and she is a licensed private investigator in California. I let Kevin Ryan know, who was a private investigator who was on um, for the Amanda DeGuio uh, episode. Once again, going way back to the summer of 2017. In fact, Amanda's episode came right up, uh, out right about when April Pitzer's did, and he uh, said if the, you know if she couldn't find anybody in California, that he'd be try to help her out any way he could. So I think that finally, um, you know, we put some. You know, I don't know what Gloria's done with it. I've not talked to her about it. What you know, what she did with the information, but I don't know where any of this is going. But I can tell you that uh, when I did see that post that I hopped into action and let um, some of the people that I've gotten to know regarding this, you know, involved and see if any of them, you know, can help her. If I get any more information in that, I guess that will come out in the next ep update episode, whenever that's going to be, maybe in December or January, going into December 2019 or January of 2020. I don't know. I haven't planned it out that far. But if anything comes of this, I'll let you know. But it seems like something is going on in April's case. Uh, I think that that is the reason uh, Gloria needed somebody, although I do not know um, if she's picked somebody yet or, or, or any of that. But, you know, like I said, about six weeks ago, she uh, sent a, a request out that she needed somebody to do a few things for her, and I'm very happy that... Caroline Lowe, Kevin Ryan, and a, and a couple other people, um, you know, responded to me and her. The next case is Jennifer Wilkerson. Uh, once again, I'm not going to be able to say as much as I would like because if I were to say what I could say without really, really, really hard proof, really, really solid um I might get a defamation suit filed against me. So, but it makes sense. All I can tell you is it makes sense. There are reasons to believe it. It's just a matter of uh, putting all the pieces together. And this is taking some time because we are having to file uh, some paperwork um, to prove some of these things. And uh, yes, when I say paperwork, I do me FOIAs, and that's I'm not going to tell you what they concern or where they went or anything else. And do not even take for granted that the FOIAs are def necessarily about Jennifer's case. All I can tell you is there's paperwork that needs to be gotten first, that needs to be looked over. But this just shows you how slow some of these things go because I think I've been talking about Jennifer Wilkinson's case like this, um, being very, um, I don't know, evasive on it, which is, I think, a nice word on this, because I have to be. Uh, but it, it still goes back to something that we believe we figured out uh, in 2018, and we're still in the process of trying to figure out if it's 100% true. Because uh, if you're going to go public with something like this, it better be 100% true. And I'll just leave it at that. But we're working on it. It's just taking some time filing for paperwork. And I am sure once we get the paperwork, it's going to take a long time to go through it. The next case is Kent Jacobs. Um just within the last couple months, and uh, I'm doing this, I'm recording this section of the update episode on August 25th, 2019, coincidentally the same day that the ebook for volume one of season two came out, and Kent's 
uh, cases in there. In fact, it's the first case in the book. But um, I think they've finally gotten permission to go on to, to the land where some people believe Kent Jacobs' remains are. I can't tell you why this happened. I don't want to get into all of that and really to get into the particulars. If you haven't listened to that episode, you should go back and listen to it. It came out on the beginning of August of 2017. But Kent went and watched a NASCAR race with a friend's house, and then he disappeared. And then this rumor came out eventually that he could be buried in a refrigerator on somebody else's property. And back in 2010, they had gotten a warrant to go onto that land, but then uh, the local environmental protection agency got involved, and they couldn't search the land as much as they want, and the land hasn't been searched since. But now uh, it seems like they've gotten permission again, and I don't know uh, Dennis Mann, who is the investigator for that. Uh, I don't think he's a licensed private investigator, but he's a guy who has devoted a, devoted a lot of, of his private time in this case. He was also the guest for the Kristen Monteferi case. Um, he's devoted a lot of his time over the years to uh, Kent's disappearance. And I don't know what's going on. I don't know if I'd be able to say even if I did. But the big deal has always been trying to get onto that land, and it seems like it's going to happen or it's happening right now. I really don't, you know, the tough thing part for me, and I write about this in the book, is that Kent's case is a drug case. Everybody around him was doing drugs. And I realize how these people will just tell story after story, lie after lie after lie, and they're more than happy to send all as good people all over the countryside looking for things. And I've tried to remain very positive about this, and that's my phone dinging, um, if you heard that. But, uh, you know, now that I've gotten, it's been two years since I covered that case, and I've gotten to know, I think, drug cases uh, a lot more, I have to tell you that there's a part of me that, that believes this is just a wild goose chase. It's almost a little, it, the story is almost a little too neat to believe that Kent Jacobs was put in a refrigerator on this land. It's almost like the stories I hear, well, the person got eaten by hogs or they were thrown into a wood chipper. I hope that's not the case. I hope that when they do get in there, they do find this refrigerator. I hope they do find remains and I, the remains. And I hope that, uh, of course, if Kent isn't still alive, which I don't think anybody does, but... If he's going to be deceased, I hope they find him on that land when they search it. My problem is that in these drug cases, um, you know, you get so many rumors that do sound believable, kind of, and, and they aren't. And it just feels to me like this is one of those. But I guess we'll see. Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman. Um, to my knowledge, uh the, the trial for Ronnie Busick, who is the only remaining man of the three who, of course, law enforcement believes killed the Freeman parents and then eventually killed Laura and Ashley. So that's, at least that's the way the story goes at this point. Of course, two of the guys are deceased and Ronnie Busick is the only guy that's still alive. Uh, I had, I think, a note from the last update that they were trying to figure out if he was... Um, mentally fit to stand trial. I don't know what happened there, but I know that no trial is going on. Of course, uh, Laureen Bible, Laura's mother, has gotten a lot of attention this summer. She went to a couple true crime conventions. There's been a TV show, a series about all of this. And uh, so that has, of course, raised the profile of this case. Of course, I've known about their disappearance for years and years and years, probably going back to the early 2000s. I mean, you know, 15 years maybe before I started Unfound, but, or maybe not, yeah, could be, yeah, they disappeared in 99, I would not be surprised if I knew about their disappearance since about 2001, yeah, that wouldn't be a surprise at all, but, um, there's now some digging going on near where Laura and Ashley were allegedly held after they were taken from the Freeman uh, home, 
And, there, and I think that, I don't know if the digging is still going on, but there was digging going on within the last few weeks. And I think that we would have heard something. I think they're, uh, if, if they had found anything, I think they're looking at wells in the area. And once again, this is a case where drugs are a part of it. And I just, I can't help but be a cynic on this. I just can't help that with drug cases because once again, you hear so many theories and stories and rumors and everything else. But at least somebody's doing something. It's been 20 years. And if there are people out there looking around and digging and everything, that's better than, I guess, than nobody doing anything. I just hope that if they don't find anything, they just get frustrated again and this everything goes silent for another 20 years. I think that Ronnie Busick is eventually going to stand trial, but you know what's come out so far is he says that he doesn't know what they did to the. Of course, he's denying everything. I I don't know what they did to them. I don't know anything. I I don't know where the remains. I don't know if they're dead. You know, he's just I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So uh, until that changes, they're going to have a very very difficult time. I think finding Laura and Ashley. The next case, Lucinda Hules. Now I have to admit there is. Nothing, um, there are no updates regarding her disappearance. Of course, this is a very old uh, case from, I think, 1984. So it's been about 35 years. But I wanted to include, so this is also the first time I think Lucinda's disappearance is getting included in it. But the reason it's in here in this episode is because I was very happy that I got to include uh, Lucinda's daughter, Deanna, who was the guest for that episode going way back to 2017. She actually got to meet with the documentary film, film guy, David Fine, when he was here. And it's something that I've talked about how he came down and interviewed me for a documentary that he's doing on the Charlie project and Megan good. I was interviewed as part of his, this project. He came, um, and must've been around July 13th or something like that. Maybe July 14th, July 5th. It was the same week that I went to the Iron Maiden concert, but, um, I had lined up a bunch of guests in the Tampa area for him to interview while he was here and he did so. So one of the people that he did get to talk to was Deanna Riley. Uh, Lucinda's daughter and I'm hoping that you know I don't know I wasn't there I don't know what was said I don't know how long they talked it's really none of my business but I was happy to uh, make that happen for both him and her because I think he wanted to add a little more context about the Charlie project about missing persons cases and I think getting to talk to some of the people who have been affected the most by them certainly would help the project and so uh, he took my recommendations on all of the people that I thought he should talk to in this area of uh, Tampa. And I, I was happy to uh, include Deanna in it because I don't know if she's ever, you know, besides doing an interview with me, I don't know if she's ever been interviewed by any program, filmmaker, TV station ever. I just don't know that. So I was happy to do that. And I'm glad that uh, they could find a time to get together and talk and, Get her on video, and I hope she's included in the project. The next case is Clinton Nelson. I think this is another one where he's his case is on an update episode for the first time, I, I think. Uh, there was a big article in the Shreveport Times uh, this past summer. A really, really good article. Really good, well-written, in-depth. Um, they talked to his mother, Carolyn, who, of course, was the guest for that episode. And I hope that you will check it out. I don't know if uh, anything has come of that. I don't know if any tips have come out. Once again, this is a it's a tough case. Um, Clinton, of course, had had his issues, and and I was looking at like the, just the 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 biggest facts about the disappearance because sometimes you know a lot of these things uh, kind of escape my mind. Of course, his father had some issues, but that's he was down here seeing his father when he disappeared. But it's really good that a disappearance that is uh, that old um, gets a really quality uh, article uh, like was written in the Shreveport Times. I, I wish more, 
you know, if there's one regret that I have in working with the Tribune Review in 2018 is we did articles every month and that was good, but they surely were not as in depth as the one that the Shreveport Times did with regarding Clinton Nelson. That's true. But I'm glad that they could make that happen, and uh, I wish I would see more of things like that for these older, more articles like that for these older disappearances where, you know, it's just not a 200-word thing just to say you did it. This is... um, This was something that was much more than that. And I hope you will go to uh, the Shreveport Times website and look for, you know, just do a search for Clinton Nelson, and I think you will find it. The next case included is Patty Actions. This is another one that makes it into this update episode because David Fine got to interview Patty's sister, Diane Rice. Of course, Patty's case is a, is a Tampa disappearance, actually a Clearwater disappearance, where, which is where I live now. And I believe, you know, I just think about that, not recently, but at one time, I th- when I think, I think when I go to play disc golf over at this park called Cliff Stevens, I think I go right by where her car was found when I go over there. I'm pretty sure. And you should also know like where another case, Kelly Rothwell's Uh, which happened, it used to be north of me, now it's south of me in India Rock Speech. I used to go by where her car was found all the time, all the time. But um, David David got to interview Diane Rice. In fact, I think that he interviewed her after he did the the video uh, of me. Uh, We did it kind of in the morning, and then I think he met with Diane in the afternoon. So once again, I'm really happy that um, they could be included I, I, especially with Patty's case being 40 years old. And I, I want to thank David again for taking time to make the time for these people. And I, there'll be a couple other mentions. I I should have mentioned with, with the Chip Campbell episode, now that I'm thinking about it, he, he got together with, um, I think, at least Lisa, uh, Chip's sister, when he was down here as well. So he really hit all the bases when he was down there, and I think that uh, that's really, really good, and getting to meet David, he's a really good guy, and I think the project uh, covering uh, the Charlie Project and M- Megan Good is going to be really, um, really positive, and I thank him for taking time for all of these former guests of Unfound. Next case, Zoe Campos, uh, of course, it was like last November now, it seems like yesterday, that Carlos Rodriguez was charged with her murder, and of course her remains were found in the back of that house that he used to live in. I have still not talked to Melinda about all of this. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where I don't want to just call her just to, for her to feel like, oh, he's just calling me to get, you know, find out what's going on. I, I never want to... I give that impression that I'm just calling just so I can find out stuff so I can tell all of you. Okay. That's, that's not just not how I work. That's not how I think. And I never want to give that impression to any of my guests because that's really not how I think. Am I interested? Of course I am. Of course I am. But, uh, this is a mother who's going to be, uh, grieving for the rest of her life. Okay, you know, whether Carlos gets, you know, of course, I think that he's going to get a decently long sentence. Of course, he's in Texas. He might get the death penalty. I just don't know. But no matter how what his sentence is, Melinda is going to be grieving for the rest of her life. And I try to remember that with all of these cases, that just because there's new information that pops up and everything doesn't mean I automatically go to the phone to try to find out what's going on. I don't want them, these guests, to ever feel like they're just a product to me. They are people. And um, I hope to talk to Melinda, and I think that I will contact her um, sometime. But I think I'll wait until if there's going to, if I hear that there's a trial date or if he pleads guilty, because there's, you Google, you Google it, there's nothing out there. If there's stuff going on, uh, it's certainly not you know, high profile. But if there's going to be a trial 
or he's he pleads guilty or something, then I think that it will be probably the next appropriate time to talk because I, I still have many, many questions about this. Not And I don't know if Melinda can answer them anyway, but I think they are questions that all of us have. How did the police miss Zoe's remains the first time around when they were on that property? How is that possible? How do you explain that phone call that, was a half hour to this friend of Melinda's that, that Zoe made. I I'd like to have a chance to talk to her about this stuff again, but I'm sure that is not, those points are not, uh, important, important to her right now. So I don't want to call her and feel like I'm just calling her to, you know, to pump her for information, but I am interested. And I think that she and I will talk again but, um, or she can contact, if she finds out I'm talking, uh, doing this update episode, she's, she can contact me anytime as any former guest on Unfound can. By this point, if you're listening to this and, uh, I don't, I, we're, like I said, it's going to be a long episode. You realize that I, as I stated at the beginning, I start at the beginning. I start with the, the cases that Unfound first covered and I work my way up to the present so if you're keeping track, you know what case is coming next. And it's probably, you know, I, I think everybody knows this. I don't think that, uh, I don't think any of my other guests are going to feel slighted by this. But Unfound and the Thomas Brown case have become almost synonymous at this point. That's not by any sort of plan. I, I think that in covering that case back in the summer of 2018. I didn't cover it any differently than any other case that I've, I, I looked at the information. Uh, Penny sent me the information. Sometimes people send me information. Sometimes they don't. Um, most of the time they don't, but when they do, I promise to read every page and I do, um, or videos or whatever else. And just, it, there was just something that happened with that. It, you could talk about the video and, and, um, but by this time, uh, over a year later, uh, I know in the discussion group, we now have like 5,700 people in there and I'm pretty sure 500 of them are from the Pampa, Perryton, Amarillo, Canadian area of Texas. Pretty, pretty sure. Pretty sure. And, um, that's just the way it's gone. Uh, it wasn't planned that way. It's just the way, you know, kind of the way it's gone. I'm not saying that Thomas Brown's case is as well known as Mara Murray's or Tara Grinstead's or Jennifer Kessie, but if things keep going this way, it will be, it will be. And I, and, and unfound will only have played a very small part in that. There's a lot of people uh, who've been working on the case well before I ever came along. Of course, Phil Klein, the private investigator, and other people. But as you already know, and I'm not going to, you know that uh, I'm not going to get into all of this stuff, but you know that I made a trip there. I went to a meetup there in Amarillo. I met with Penny. We rode around. I took some video. I took some pictures. Um, you know about the ripped signs that happened uh, around the July 4th uh, time. And I wish I could say more about that, but it would be too inflammatory. Something I learned while I was there, but I'm just going to leave it out. But you know about that. Of course, whoever did that has not been caught. And, um, of course, Pine Gregory, he was fired, I think, after the last upset date episode. Now, he was fired because of very, very poor police work. He was um, catching people doing things, but... There wasn't a lot of evidence and um, just very, very sloppy. And that should be no surprise because that was his reputation before he ever even started working in Hemp Hill County. But probably the biggest point, and this just happened, um, doing this once again, recording this on August 25th, 2019, just this past Wednesday, five days ago, four days ago, uh, the, the AG's office in Texas and the Texas Rangers closed their, they didn't close it. They suspended their investigation into Thomas's disappearance and what we believe murder because his remains of course were found back in January. A lot of people are very, very upset about this, uh, myself included, but I can't say that I'm surprised either. 
I've been saying, I guess privately, not like off the record privately, but um, I don't think I've been this explicit like on the YouTube live shows or anything, but I kind of thought this was the way it was going to go because of all of the politics and everything else in this particular case. All right. Um, a lot of people, of course, believe that Sheriff Lewis involved. They believe that Pine Gregory is involved. And, uh, you know, and I've really, really, really tried to avoid that. I have my own personal theories that I have kept, I think, fairly uh, close to the vest, I think. And um, even though some people out there think that I've said some things that I haven't, and I continue to get accused of that when I haven't, I've done no such thing. But the closing or the suspending the investigation was not a surprise to me. The longer this went went on, uh, the more I thought it was going to go this way. Why? Because it's the easy way out. Frankly, just to be frank with you, I think it's the easy way out. And I, I'm just going to leave it at that. The truth is that having now been to Canadian Texas, having been in the exact spot where uh, the Durango was parked, having been out to the general area where his remains were and where the phone was found and where his backpack was and went to Franks and went to the junior, I was all over the place. That you realize that that is a town that is very divided. The people that just that really, really want to know what happened to Thomas, and then those people who just want it to go away. Just could not, they don't, aren't necessarily taking sides. They just want it all to go away. They want their peaceful Canadian back. And anytime you have a situation like that and you have remains were found, but there's still no cause of death and, and all the other things that have gone on here in this case, it doesn't surprise me that uh, that they're just suspending it. Now, is it going to stay suspended? Are people going to be outraged enough for them to re-engage? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not feeling too positive about it five days after the suspension, but it didn't surprise me. And I guess what I'm saying is I think that the AG's office and the Texas Rangers are more than happy to allow the voters of Hemp Hill County to sort this all out. And I felt that way for a long time. I have. Just because it continues to drag on, drag on, you're not hearing much and, and all these other things. Um, of course, what did came out of the suspension of the suspension of the investigation and Penny going in there and talking to all you know the, the people involved is that we now know for a fact that Pine Gregory was the guy who found Thomas's remains, and this has brought up a whole host of because people don't forget people who are into this case do not forget, and they start thinking about how it, that day or whenever it was, Phil Klein wanted to search an area and Pine Gregory was sitting out there telling, no, you can't go into this area. Well, it just happened to be the area where Thomas's reins were, were found eventually. And Pine Gregory was sitting in his sheriff's vehicle approximately 500 yards from where the remains were found. And he says, no, you don't have to search in there. This area's already been searched. He told that to Phil Klein. Phil Klein went on the record about that. Phil Klein did a interview with Chris Sample KXDJ, uh, you know, uh, last week, and Pine Gregory was uh, a big part of that talk. And then Penny was on KXDJ, I think, on Friday. This just a couple days ago. So it's suspended, and as I told Penny when I talked to her, and I don't think I'm speaking uh, out of school on this, but. She is now in the position, as most of my guests are, where the police aren't actively in, in investigating a disappearance. This is the, the situation most guests are, especially since Unfound covers so many cases that are older, 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old. And the police officers there maybe don't even know. I, I mean, if Ed Madge can forget about 
Peggy and Patty McDaniel, two girls going missing, and then surely other police officers can forget about disappearances that are even more recent. So, um, that's what's going on uh, there. Penny is now in the same boat as most of the guests, where they are going to have to do things themselves now. They're going to have to find... If they're going to continue to believe, and as I do believe, that Thomas was murdered, they're going to have to go out and find the, the proof that that is the case. Because there is not one law enforcement officer on the face of the earth now that is looking into Thomas's murder. And it sucks. But, um... So, Penny and I had a, a deep discussion about that a few days ago. And probably where everything needs to go from here. So that's the update on, on Tom Brown. I know many of you, because once again, unfound in Tom Brown's case are almost synonymous. Now I, I maybe doing this update is almost overkill, but I thought I should do it, uh, anyway. So there you go. Tom Brown update. Next case, in fact, uh, it was the week that just we're not even going to skip any cases. We're going uh, Thomas Brown and Amanda Fravel's case were back to back weeks back uh, in the summer of 2018. And I have to tell you that, uh, you know, those two cases being back to back, I think in both of them, you know, I, I think we do the best work we can do every week, but I, I really thought. Uh, on those particular cases, them being back to back, um, were certainly highlights, I think of 2018 about the information and the things that of course, Amanda's case being over 30 years old, that we could bring to the public that had not been heard before. Of course, in Thomas's case seen before, and it was nice to do that, you know, in back to back weeks and regarding Amanda Fravel's case, uh, once again, I, have to watch what I say here, but uh, Melissa, her sister, who was the uh, interview for that episode, just within the last couple weeks, got to have a very in-depth conversation with someone in law for- law enforcement, and they contacted her. Now I know she's been Melissa has been doing some things. Uh, she's been trying to get uh, P- uh, Metro in Las Vegas to you know start looking into some of these things, but. Um, I'm just, I'm just going to say a law enforcement officer. She got to have, she was, uh, I think she was a little nervous about it, but I, she, um, got to talk to this person over the phone and uh, I think it's a very, very positive development. And uh, in talking to her before this conversation with this law enforcement officer happened, I, I reiterated to her, get to talk to this person, make sure you bring up Xavier um, Amanda's boyfriend slash ex-boyfriend at the time. Remember to bring up Lou Franks. Do not forget those things. You know, be prepared, have some notes. And I think that, uh, the conversation went very well. Now, my understanding is that the reason that this law enforcement officer was talking to her about Amanda's disappearance is because they may be trying to connect something else to Amanda's disappearance. Maybe, but that there is even somebody in law enforcement who now, who knows it was looking over Amanda's paperwork after 30 some years is a very, very positive development. Not to mention now that Melissa now has this law enforcement officer's number, can reach this person anytime she wants and to see what's going on. It's a very positive development in this, even though of course the case isn't solved but that she got to have an in-depth conversation for an hour about Amanda, you know, and somebody who can actually do something that has the power of government, the power of the badge behind him uh, is very positive. And I think that Melissa uh, was very happy that it happened. That's all I can really say uh, right at this second. But like I said, it, this just happened maybe three weeks ago. I think this is um, maybe going to be the first time. I'll, it's Like I said, I haven't, I think I looked at the last update episode to see what cases were covered, but I did not look at the first update episode uh, that we did last year to see what cases were in it. But I'm thinking this is the first time we've mentioned Ellen Sloan's name. And 
I think just within the last month, maybe to six weeks, her daughter had contacted me. Um, I guess there were some remains found in Montana. And um, Brianne, you know, wants to find out, you know, could could these remains be her mother? And we just talked about that a little bit. Uh, you know, as it goes with any of my guests, all 140 of them, and that's e- – Technically, could see even more than that. Well, as far as cases covered, it's about 140, so it would be 140. Any of these guests can contact me anytime for opinions, advice. Um, they want me to call somebody, talk to somebody, email somebody because they're afraid to do it themselves because they don't exactly know what to say. I am on call with all of my guests 24 7, always. Always. That's going to be a little tough maybe when I'm in Canada in Canada in a couple weeks. But even if I'm out in the disc golf course this coming weekend, if somebody calls me, emails me, or, or texts me or something, I will get back to them as soon as I have a break. This is my policy with all guests who have ever been on the program. And so when Brianne, her daughter, contacts me and, you know, and lets me know about this, of course we talk it over. And uh, I'm not going to get say exactly what we talked about, but you know she, you know, wanted some tips and what she what I thought and everything, and we talked it over. So I'm very happy that although I haven't talked to Brienne a ton since she was on the program, I, I'm very happy that um, she came to me. She trusts me. She knows I'm going to be truthful with her, and I, I deeply appreciate. Um, that she um, respects my advice. So I don't know uh, what's going on with these remains. I you know, don't know exactly where they were found or anything, but um, it's good that Brienne keeps up on that, what's going on in Montana. If any remains are found, I think that's very good what she's doing. And uh, if something comes of this, I will let you know. Next update, Stephen Kocher. Uh, I can't say any more than I said the last time, and I, I covered it, uh, talked about Stephen's case back in April. There continues to be one guy in particular. I haven't talked to him for a while, but that's neither my fault or his fault, uh, who is working on Stephen's case exclusively. Uh, he is not a private investigator. He has like a real job, so he has to do this in his spare time, but I can tell you that he's doing very good work. Um, he's certainly putting in the time outside of his regular job on, you know, on his own dime and everything to try to, um, get more answers, uh, than I think any private person has since Steven disappeared. Uh, this is a, a case of course, that's, I feel very close to because I lived very close to where he disappeared at the time in Las Vegas. He lived, he di- disappeared, what, seven miles from where I lived. And I, and I can remember kind of around that time in 2009, but as I stated before I started this list of missing people for this episode, I don't plagiarize people. It's been a topic of all on its own within the last few weeks uh, on Unfound on the, the live show and elsewhere. But I don't scoop other people either. If people are working on something and they're planning to do their own program on it or whatever else, I'm more than happy to sit back and allow. I have enough cases my own. I don't need to on my own. I don't need to scoop other people. I really don't. So I appreciate that this guy has kept me posted. Um, he's you know he's asked me for advice once in a while. You know run things by me. Although like I said we haven't talked recently, and um, you know I certainly hope that he can solve the case all on his own. And if he does. Great for him. I, I couldn't be more happy for him and the coach or family if they figure out what happened to Steven. But I know that he's working on it. I just can't talk about anything um, simply because uh, he'll tell you uh, when he's good and ready. The next case, Dale Kerstetter. Now, I don't I don't know, want to be negative about this, but in the history of Unfound, and it's about uh, if you're listening to this, you're listening to this on September um, 13th, I think it would be. I think that's when I have this, this slated to come out. September 13th of 2019. You know that the third year anniversary played the weekend bef- week before this, the Friday of, of September 6th of 2019. 
But in three years of this program, I think the biggest nothing burger that has ever been out there was the video that got released about three weeks ago uh, regarding Dale Kerstetter's disappearance. Now, you have to remember that up to this point, the video that everybody has seen uh, regarding Dale's disappearance was actually a recreation. It was not the real thing. It came from a Unsolved Mysteries episode from way back in the late 80s, early 90s. Well, nobody in the public had seen the actual real video until a few weeks ago. Um, there is a site, Muckrock or something like that, .com, that ended up filing a FOIA to release the video. And the, the law enforcement that is, that is responsible for Dale Kerstetter's disappearance in Pennsylvania released it. And everybody was excited. And then we got to watch it. And it is, you, f you know, you forget how far video has come. Video technology has come in 30 some years. I'm 49. I remember the 1980s. People had VHS cameras and we were perfectly, I mean, they were big and bulky and you can only film two hours at a time and all of that. But we thought they were pretty good quality. Now that you look back at it, it's like, oh my God. But there was something, the video was horrible. And I think it's not just because it was, a, it was necessarily because it was 80s technology. There was obviously something wrong with the recorder itself. It looked like it was out of phase. And I don't even know if, remember, you know, you have to be kind of old. You have to be at least into your 40s to remember this. But remember the tracking could get on, off on VHS um, devices and it just wouldn't look right. It'd be kind of, it would be um, staticky and everything. Well, this is what that video, and I'm sure maybe a, a lot of you have already w tried to watch it. It is unwatchable as it sits. Uh, I think a lot of people were excited to see what that was, and it's just as it sits. Like I said, I'm going to say it again, as it sits. Now, having been a filmmaker at one time and know, you know, sometimes when film and video doesn't come out as as well as you'd like, there are a lot of things you can do to make it better. And I'm hoping that some video expert will take the time to try to do that. Uh, it seems to me that if you could cut out, it's because it's, it's like there's a picture and then there's a lot of static and then there's a picture and there's a lot of static and it goes very, very, very quick. That's the only way I can explain it audio-wise. But I think if somebody could cut out all the static and wrinkly stuff on the screen and just get those very quick snippets where the video is like maybe 40% clear, you might have something. Now, the video is quite long. It's like 8 or 10 minutes, 50 minutes. Now, in the end, you may only have like 30 seconds to watch, but it might be worth it, maybe. But somebody is going to have to put in some really, really hard time, long time, I think, to do that, even with 21st, sec tech, 21st century technology doing it. But, um, of course, the guest for that episode was the blogger Heather um, Grotman, and I did talk to her after the video came out, and we had a discussion about it, and I said some of the things I'm telling you right now. By the way, she runs the uh, Lost and Found blogs. I hope you'll check that out. Uh, I think she does great work. But I think that she was, uh, you know, somewhat let down by it uh, as well. And I, you know, I will tell you this. In seeing the video when I finally did get to watch it, in seeing it, it even more reinforces my idea that it was all an inside job and Dale was in on it. I think somebody knew that the video in that, in that plant stunk. As soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, I know what happened here. Somebody knew the video stunk and they could go in there and they wouldn't have to worry about being seen because the video doesn't record right and they'd be going in and, and doing this. And I think Dale was in on it. I think it was an inside job and I think that uh, I, I think that he got suckered into it. I think he thought he was part uh, of a partnership doing this and really what it was was he was going to end up disappearing because of it. I'm still 
even more than ever. I'm absolutely convinced of that. I'm not here to assassinate Dale's character. But, as you know, I call it like I see it. So the video, a big nothing burger, but I'm hoping somebody with a really good video skills can change that. All right, the next case we're going to talk about, or I guess I'm going to talk about, is Lacey Buenfil. Uh, if you'll remember the last update back in April, I believe we talked about how uh, her family finally got her declared deceased and they got a death certificate and they've been able to do some things because of that. Uh, however, uh, the investigation into her disappearance continues and that was all facilitated through uh, some attention that her disappearance got in Orlando from the local news there. Although I would not say that her disappearance occurred close to Orlando and was like north and west of there, but Orlando has done some coverage on her disappearance once in a while, and I guess a reporter over there uh, took it upon herself to really look into this and they had been having some issues trying to get this death certificate for Lacey, Lacey and they finally did so. But the update uh, for this episode is, once again, like Deanna Riley and like Diane Rice, uh, I was able to uh, get Cindy Fox, who of course is Lacey's mother-in-law, and Cindy was the guest for that episode. Cindy got together with, once again, with the, the documentary filmmaker, David Fine, uh, when he was down here in July. She was another one of the uh, guests that he interviewed. I think they got together maybe the day before he came over here to talk to me. And so I was uh, happy to make that happen. Uh, once again, I need to state that I am not there for any of these interviews. All I did was give David... Uh, these guests' phone numbers and emails I got prior uh, approval from them before I did that, and then it was up to him to contact them and, and make all the scheduling arrangements so they could meet, and he did that while he was down here. And you're probably wondering, well, he must have been down here for a while. Uh, I think he was down here for four or five days, and I think he met two people per day, I think I said uh, when I talked about Patty Actions, uh, case earlier that I think he met Patty's sister Diane the same day that he came over here and interviewed me. So I think he was seeing two people per day. And he came in, man, it seems like a Monday now. It was over a month ago. I think he was here on a Monday. And I think that that previous Friday is when he had seen uh, Lisa Kassoon. Uh, he interviewed her and then it was like two per day. And then the last day that he was here was the day that he interviewed myself and Diane. I believe that's how it went. So Cindy Fox, uh, Lacey's mother-in-law, uh, got interviewed by David Fine. I don't know how that's all going to intertwine into this project, but that I was able to make it happen. They were very happy with how they got interviewed. Um, they loved the opportunity to talk about their missing loved one. Uh, so uh, I was happy to make that happen. I certainly hope that they are all included in the project when it's finished. And this is a project that is covering the Charlie Project and in particular Megan Good. Let's move on to the next one. I got quite a few uh, things to say about this next case, and this would be Jansen Brewer and Daniel Braden. And... I don't believe, of course, this is a, we're now getting much closer to the present. So, as you was, as you would suspect, uh, when you have these newer cases, not as much as probably happened, but uh, quite a bit went on, has gone on in this case since I did the last update in April of 2019. Out of nowhere, this must have been. Must have been in May. I think I had moved to the place I'm living now when this all happened. So it must have been in May sometime of 2019. An investigator from 
the district attorney's office in the county where these two men disappeared called me. And he left me a message. And, and the way I remember it, we kind of played phone tag. I called him back, but he wasn't there. And then I called him back again, and he wasn't there. And then he called me back, and that's how we finally got to talk, something like that. And I'm not going to mention his name or anything, however, do have his number now saved in my phone. But this investigator with that county uh, where these two men disappeared, uh, we talked. And the reason that he called me is that he had been talking to Jansen Brewer's mother, he had, and he had found out that I had talked to Jansen's sister-in-law. Now, I know that we're throwing around a lot of uh, names here and titles and everything, but... Uh, just to go, kind of go through this again, Jansen Brewer, whose mother I had on as the guest for that episode, uh, Jansen has uh, at least some brothers, maybe he has a sister, I, I can't remember exactly, but he has an older brother who is a bit estranged from their mother. They don't talk much. And he is married uh, to a woman, and after the episode came out, this... Uh, this uh, wife of Daniel Bre uh, Jansen Brewer's older brother contacted me and got the idea that Jansen's mother and this woman uh, don't get along too well. Like I said, uh, Jansen's mother is estranged from this particular son. That's the way I understand it, okay? And I'm not here to get in the middle of any of those types of things. The, I think these things... Uh, it, you know, um, like in this case, uh, was going on well before Jansen ever disappeared. Things happen like that in families and, it, and it's gone on in mine as well. But she contacted me to tell me that some of the things that, um, Laura said, uh, Jansen's mother, uh, weren't correct. And so we talked about it back and forth and this sister-in-law had a story about how they got to see this video. Now, nobody else has gotten to see this video. Laura herself, Jansen's mother, has not gotten to see this video, but we talked about it during our interview. And so I got to talk to this sister-in-law about how all that happened. And I had those conversations saved because it was through Messenger. It wasn't over the phone. And I still have those uh that those conversations back and forth saved. Well, this investigator must have found out about this conversation I had with his sister-in-law through Laura, Jansen's mother. And so he contacted me and he said, I understand you had a chance to talk to the sister-in-law about this video. And I don't believe this investigator, the, the feeling that I got is that he didn't know about this video either. Now, once again, he's not an investigator who works for the police department or the, the sheriff's office in that area. He works for the district attorney. So after charges are brought, and I have no idea what's going on, and I didn't even ask because I'm sure he wasn't going to tell me anything anyway. But he wanted to know the content of that conversation. So I made a copy of it, and I sent it to him. So something's going on in that case. I just don't know what. I have not talked to this investigator uh, since May. But when I talked to him, I asked him, would you also like the conversation that I had with Scotty Hughes? And Scotty Hughes uh, feature, was featured prominently in that episode, The Disappearance of Jansen Brewer and Daniel Braden. I had a chance to talk to him, and I told you all about it in a former update episode, and you can go back and check that, but in my mind, he should be considered a suspect in this disappearance. Um, I, I had a conversation with him that was cordial at times, and then he got um, less cordial, let's just put it that way, and I don't know if I ever blocked him or anything. Maybe I, I think I did. He was all upset I wouldn't let him in the discussion group. And I told him why, and he got all ticked off about that, and I think I eventually did have to block him on Facebook. But So I told this investigator, would you like 
to have a copy of the conversation that I had with Scotty Hughes, too. He said, sure. So I sent that to him uh, as well. I've not gotten any news back regarding any of that. Uh, there have been no follow-up emails or phone calls to me to ask me anything that was in either of those conversations. Now, I will say, uh, in the sister-in-law's case situation, the conversation is much more organized. It's like a long paragraph, then my long paragraph, then her long paragraph, very easy to understand. Whereas with Scotty and being that, well, Scotty, Scotty, the conversation isn't organized, it's a little disjointed, and of course, half the things he's saying, I, I don't personally believe, but that will be up to the investigator to look to in, look into himself. And so, it's a, a much more disjointed conversation, and I... I think I tried to express that when I sent that to the investigator. That's one conversation, pretty, you're going to be able to understand it pretty, pretty well. This other one with Scotty, probably not as much. It's going to take a little more concentration. But I'm happy to help out. And this is a perfect example of what we try to do with Unfound. Is It's very helpful, I think, to these in investigators that they know what people have said to others, whether it's a reporter like myself or just other members in the public who aren't reporters, to see if all of their statements uh, match up. And being that I have a copy of it, of course it was done through Messenger, there's no uh, suspicion that I'm making anything up or there's going to be any blowback. You know, the person said, well, I never said that or anything. Now it's right there. Black and white, well, Messenger, it's blue and white, um, blue and gray, for people to see and for the investigator to see. And if he can, you know, make anything of it, maybe I'm hoping that it gave him some more things to do regarding the disappearances of both of these guys. I realize that Daniel Braden, the other person in the disappearance, is no saint. And I, I've actually been in contact, not recently, been in contact with his daughter regarding all of this once again though not recently i don't think i've talked to her since maybe the beginning of this year or something like that but i think these are the types of situations i like to put unfound in that we've talked to somebody and then uh talking to that person then helps investigators move a case forward and we have a record of that uh, conversation, especially if it can be written, because over the phone, as you know, laws, at least in the United States, you have to get permission uh, to record people, at least in Florida you do, because it's a two-party state. So being that I live here, I have to get permission before I ever record any phone calls, and any of my guests know uh, that's how it goes, because I have to ask them that. Um... So that's what went on. It was a, a call that was completely out of the blue, and I was happy to help. Now, as far as I, I see in my notes here that I talked about uh, the video, I still have, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go through everything that the video showed. I still, frankly, have concerns on how that video was found. It stretches my imagination, and I know that's a... Uh, saying uh, a few words that I use quite a bit when I write in the blog at Patreon, and I use that statement, stretches my imagination quite a bit in my summations as well, that I know how difficult it is for somebody who's never been involved in investigating a disappearance at all, especially, of course, somebody in the public that just has this happen to him or her, and then suddenly they have to become Columbo. It's very difficult for people to figure out what they need to do while the police are doing everything that they're doing, or maybe they're not doing it. And that this video was found the way it was found, the way this sister-in-law explained it to me. It certainly seems uh, coincidental that they just happened to go to the right area where uh, Jansen was, that they just happened to go into the right place and that place just happened to have video, and it just happened to show exactly what everybody uh, is looking for, which is Jansen on tape or on video uh, with Scotty Hughes' truck. And, of course, the problem is they didn't get it. They didn't say make a copy of that, 
hey, we're going to call the police right now, come down to get that. They didn't do anything like that. It makes me, it's just a little weird. But I was happy to help uh, this investigator from the D- district attorney's office. Uh, however, I have no idea in what direction the investigation is going. Maybe I should give that guy a call. Maybe I should put that on my list of things to do. So uh, there you go. The next case is Ashley Summers. It's not so much an update, but it's just an update to tell you that I don't think anything has changed since uh, the last time. I I did a Google search very quickly before starting all this uh, and recording this uh, update episode. And these charges continue to exist against Ashley's Uncle Kevin, but I am pretty convinced that there are others who could have been involved in this. If we're to believe that Kevin had something to do with it, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I still think back to the when I talked to Linda, who was Ashley Summers' grandfather's wife at the time, if you can follow that, Linda. And I can remember early on in talking to her, I, I said, you know what, I this Kevin guy sounds a little squirrely. And this was before any of these charges, well before we ever did the interview for the episode. And then it turned out that, yes, that they've charged uh, Kevin with uh, rape, attempted rape, um, that he was abusing uh, underage kids. And I believe that he is still in jail, but I don't believe that he's ever been sentenced. Uh, I don't think there's been a trial Uh, Anything like that, I think that Linda would let me know if anything like that was going on. Like I said, I did a Google search very quickly to see if the status of that case had changed, and I just saw nothing. So uh, maybe they're building a case against him. I just don't know what's going on. Maybe they're looking for more victims. I just don't know because it's been a while now. It's been, when was it? Maybe November? I'm trying to think. Uh My mother died in November 28th of 2018. I think this was before this that, maybe not. Um, I think uh, time goes by so fast. But it seems like he was charged uh, with all of these crimes quite a while ago. Uh, I think definitely in 2018, not 2019. But just nothing has happened. Maybe it's much like Carlos Rodriguez, who uh, was brought into custody toward the end of last year, and still nothing has been done with him uh, yet either. But just uh, no updates, and so uh, Uncle Kevin, I think, still sits in a cell. I don't think he got bail or anything, so he still sits in a cell, in a cell, uh, waiting uh, for trial. Or Once again, I don't know how this is all going to go, but I, of course, really believe that he is responsible for Ashley's disappearance. Next case I want to talk about, actually we have two different points for me to make for the disappearances of Bonnie and Jeremy Degas. You remember this is a case that happened really not too far away from where I live. This happened on the east side of Tampa over in the Brandon area. Uh, This is, um, and the guest for that episode was Bonnie, Bonnie's mother, Linda Hirschberger. And first of all, she's another uh, guest who got interviewed by David Fine. And she uh, was uh, contacted her. Had I don't think I'd talked to her for a while, but I'd contacted her. Was she interested? And, and she said yes. And David and she were able to make that happen. I was Once again, as I've stated in the other cases I've already talked about on this particular topic, I was very happy to do that. And I really don't know the last time that Linda had ever been interviewed besides myself, but for anything uh, in a video nature. And I I think it's great that she gets interviewed twice about her daughter and her grandson's disappearance twice within the same year. And I don't know if that's ever happened to her, you know, in many, many years. We have to remember that Bonnie disappeared uh, back in the 1990s. So... Uh, I was happy to make that happen, and I'm hoping that 
something positive comes from that. The other point I need to make about this uh, case is that for a, a very long time, I don't know how long, but I know it's well, 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 well before Unfound got involved in Bonnie and Jeremy's disappearances, that there was a troll out there on Facebook and elsewhere. His name was Christian Underkoffler, U-N-D-E-R-K-O-F-L-E-R. -E and for many, many years, he has been tormenting Linda's family has been harassing them, saying a lot of uh, mean things, and then on top of everything else, uh, he has claimed that he is Jeremy Degas. He, that's what he claims. And somehow I think that that has been disproven. I, I think that most n nobody believes that Christian Underkoffler is truly D Jeremy Degas. But he has been out there on different forums, maybe even on Web Sleuths and elsewhere, stating that that's who he is. But of course, he has never offered up any proof. On the total other hand, he claims that he's Jeremy Degas, but he's harassing Linda and everybody uh, in Bonnie and, and Jeremy's family. He's really, and I think they've blocked him, and I think they've talked to the police about him and everything else. And even when Unfound got involved, I don't believe that he ever contacted me, but I do know that he contacted my assistant, Emily, and they had a back and forth that was about what you'd expect from a troll. And she had to block him, and Emily and I talked about him. We both say that he, he's just crazy. I don't know if he's crazy. Is he mean? Is he bipolar? Is he schizophrenic? He just likes harassing people? I don't know. I've seen what he's written. I've seen what he, he's posted on Facebook and elsewhere. Uh, I, of course, saw the conversations that he and Emily had. Just hard to say whether he's just a mean guy or there's just something wrong with him. Well, either way, where is he now? He is now in custody in the county that I live in, in Pinellas County, Florida. Now, you have to keep in mind... Christian Underkoffler lived in Ohio. He had been doing this all from Ohio. He is not from the Tampa area and is and, and doing all this trolling. He's from Ohio. Well, it got to the point finally where the police thought they had enough proof, evidence to charge him. And they went and got him in Ohio and brought him here to Florida and charged him with making threats and a whole, you know, bunch of other charges that had to do with what he's been doing all these years. I don't know if that has ever happened to him. I don't know if he's ever been ever charged with anything ever. Now, how long can you keep him in jail for something like that? I don't know. I'm guessing there, there, if he's found guilty or he pleads guilty, there's some prison time, but it's not like he killed somebody. So, and I'm guessing that if he's out on bail, that he's restricted, uh, as far as not being able to use any computer devices, any phones, anything like that. But finally, and I'm not saying that Unfound had anything to do with this. This just happened within the last six weeks, I think. And we covered Bonnie and Jeremy's disappearance toward the end of 2018. So I'm not saying our coverage had anything to do with him finally um, being brought into custody for all the horrible things that he's been doing over the all these years. But I did post about this in the in the group when it happened. And now, coincidentally, he's right here in the same county in jail uh, where I live. Once again, Pinellas County, which is the county that where St. Petersburg and Clearwater are. Uh, Tampa, the actual city of Tampa, is over across the bay in the other county, which is called Hillsborough County, whereas I'm over here in Pinellas. So there you go. Uh, a troll who finally got in trouble and finally was brought into custody for what he was doing online and it had to do with one of the cases that Unfound covered. Next case, Tim Beauchart. The last time I did an update, I talked about how some members of his gang had been brought into custody and hoping that we were hoping that something might come out of that. Now, I can say that I don't believe anything has come out of that. 
Yet, the reason I felt that I needed to talk about it is there's another case that I'm trying to cover. It's I've talked to the missing young man's mother a couple times, and there's just some things that are still... I'm not saying she's lied to me. I'm not saying that at all. There's just some things that I think that I need to look into when I have some time to verify some of the information that she has told me. And I've talked to another, a couple other people about this particular di- disappearance, which I'm not going to name as well. But some names that have popped up in this case uh, that I'm trying to cover, these names somehow could be connected to Tim's disappearance as well. And I can tell you these are some names uh, that were not mentioned during my interview with uh, Tim's mother. So I'm still trying to verify all of that. And as you can uh, predict, I haven't had a lot of time. But I think to cover this other case, this new new case, the right way, I think I do have to verify that information and see it if it all makes sense to me. Um, it, it very well may be that Tim's disappearance and the disappearance of, of this other young man are related. Uh, it's in the same state of Mississippi, although I don't believe the... These two were in a gang together. Of course, Tim uh, was in a gang. I don't believe that this other young man who disappeared was in a gang. I'm not saying he he was a saint either, but um, these are things that uh, I had found out about this disappearance. And then in looking into it and talking to his mother, uh, Tim Boshart's name came up. Uh, This mother knows Uh, Tim Boshart's mother, and there are some additional names, uh, a drug dealer and some other people that could also be connected to both. So it may very well be that Tim and this other guy whose name I'm once again not going to use, uh, their disappearances could be connected even though they did not happen uh, very close to each other. So it's something that I continue to look into, and when I can say more, I will. The next case is Desiree Ferris. Her disappearance has gone national. Investigation Discovery has caught on to the case, and they have a really nice article about her disappearance on their website. I hope you will check that out. If you will remember, Desiree disappeared after she was around a couple rough guys and allegedly one of these guys dropped her off on some street in some seedy neighborhood and she disappeared of course I don't think there are too many people who've been following that case that believe it but of course as you would suspect Desiree had her own share of problems but I think it's so good when a case like this gets picked up nationally And the person who is missing isn't, you know, some pristine prom queen that does her ad, some drug issues, running around with the wrong crowd. And I really like it when uh, these national programs, national websites have the courage to cover people who have made some bad choices as well. I think that's good. You know, that's my attitude that I view everybody... Uh, the same. I view every missing person uh, that we cover the same. I don't care what they've chosen to do uh, with their life. And I think that that is a good principle for everybody who covers these disappearance cases. And I'm certainly happy that Investigation Discovery did not shy away from covering Desiree Ferris's case, even though she uh, made some bad choices. In contrast to people climbing over each other to cover Jennifer Kessie's case and uh, Tara Grinstead's case. Um, it's nice that Desiree is getting her share of the na- uh, of the national attention. I don't know where it's going to go. I think that that case is a matter of... I think we know kind of what happened. We know the people involved. It just isn't a lot of hard evidence. There's just a lot of circumstantial evidence. I'm hoping this national coverage will bring 
some hard evidence forward so that the guy or guys can be charged and that her remains, if she is not alive, of course, I do not believe that. That's just my opinion, that that her remains uh, can be found. So good on the uh, on investigation discovery for giving Desiree some national attention. Next, Deborah Asbury. Uh, the update for this one is very similar to the Pamela Golden one in that somebody in a suspect's or person of interest family finally gets to hear the episode and they write me or they write my guest uh, a very bad, very nasty email. And that's what happened to Courtney. Courtney is Deborah's daughter. Courtney was the guest for that episode. She got a message from someone in Homer's family. If that name doesn't jump out to you, I realize it's been a while since Deborah's uh, episode came out. But Homer was the guy who was living with Deborah and what was it, her sister and their kids uh, at the time of Deborah's disappearance. There was, over the years, there's been a lot of attention given to a couple other men in Deborah's life. But it seems to me that Homer was the guy who was forgotten in all of this, and he was the guy who was living at the house. And we really put a, um, a fine point on that. We really stressed that in the episode that we did. Of course, once again, me interviewing Courtney, Deborah's daughter. Well, somebody in Homer's family uh, messaged Deborah, and she sent the message on to me. I did not copy it and put it here. Why? Because it's practically illegible. It's English, but... <laughs> There aren't a lot of capitalized words. There aren't many periods in it. It's like a one full run-on sentence. I believe that it's actually from, I don't believe it's some troll or anything. I do believe that it's somebody from Homer's family. But it's nasty, it's dirty, and I just was not going to read something like that on Unfound, which is a PG-rated program. And that's why I didn't mind reading the other one, because it was PG. I still think the... The Shannon person who wrote that message, who posted that comment on the Potomatic site, uh, doesn't know what she is talking about. But in this case, it's kind of the same situation where a person goes on and on, nothing but lies, 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 and then never says what those lies are. And as I stated you know, an hour ago when I talked about uh, Pamela Golden's case, if you're going to message me and tell me that my guest stated some lies, then you tell me what those lies are. Tell me where my guest is getting it wrong, or, and we can talk about it. But if you're going to contact me and just say it was all lies and leave it at that, and you're just a bad reporter, and you're just a rumor monger, which of course I don't do, and everything, I'm not responding to you. I'm just not. I'm just going to delete it, and that'll be that. Whereas, for example, going back to the Jansen Brewer, Daniel Braden case, after the episode came out, uh, Jansen's sister-in-law, his older brother's wife, contacted me and gave me her side of the disappearance. She said that Laura Jansen's mother got some things wrong, and we talked about it. Now, do I still have concerns about everything? Yes. I've already stated about the video, etc., but at least we had a conversation. And she, when she contacted me, she stated, you know what, here are the things that I think Laura got wrong in the interview. And she, she wrote and she typed them out. And I can have a discussion with somebody like that. I can't have a discussion with people who just say it's nothing but lies and just leave it at that. And they're going to say, what's well, defamation and everything? Well, tell me what's defaming. Let's talk about it. And uh, those types of people, um, they just leave it very, very open-ended. I Really, I think the reason they do that is because they have nothing else to say. They just don't like what was said. And that doesn't mean that what we talked about are lies. All it means is that somebody didn't like it, which is something totally different. You know, you cannot like something and it still be the truth. Right? So... 
there's that. So Courtney got this message. She sent it to me. I said, I don't, I, unless they're willing to talk about what you actually lied about, then there's not, there's nowhere to go with this. And that's what I say to all of my guests when they get a nasty message like that. And that's the way I think when I get them myself. Next, Mary Lands. After Unfound's coverage, and I'm not saying this was due to Unfound's coverage. I really don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. There was a new search for, done for her in Taconchua, Michigan. And that is in Calhoun County. And that search was done around June 9th of 2019. We covered Mary's disappearance back in April or May. Uh, about a month before this search was done. This area is not near where she lived. And the news articles state that there were a couple tips that came in that pointed police in this direction. I don't know what to make of it. You know how I feel about tips that come in so many years after a person has gone missing. My interpretation of the way disappearances happen is more like what happens, for example, in Zoe Campus's case. Now, that isn't an old case. It's from 2013, but when it all went down last year, the case was about five years old. To me, I think when police have solid evidence, you see what happened in that case. They go right there, and there's not much question you know, what's going on, even though I think we are all surprised, including myself, including Zoe's mother, about what went on. But on the other hand, in Mary's case, when they're saying, well, we got a couple tips and they're searching far away from where the person disappeared and it's months later and we've not heard any news, I'm inclined to believe that these tips weren't uh, as substantial as the police thought. That's what I'm inclined to think. I think that when tips are good, then evidence is found very quickly. If you see that cops are out there all day, into the evening, into the night, and they haven't found anything, and they say they're out there because of a tip, but they're still looking 12 hours later, I'm inclined to believe that the tip isn't very good. It looks good when they get it, but if a tip is going to be good, then it should lead police right to the general area of where remains are going to be found, or maybe a gun's going to be found, a knife is going to be found with the missing person's blood on it, etc. But when you get a tip and you're still looking around 12 hours later, I start believing that there's probably, it's probably just a rumor. It might be a psychic. Who the heck knows? Unfortunately, but I'm at least glad to see that in Mary's case, being that it's not a very new case, what, 15 years old, if not older, that, because I don't, I, you should know in doing this, I don't put the dates on, on this uh, form that I write out to do these update episodes, but I know Mary Lands is in the early 2000s, um, that the police are so responsive to something like that, even if it was a bad tip, I, I think is, is positive. Uh, I'm glad they're not blowing everything off, and I'm glad that they could get organized to get people out there to look for Mary's remains, even though it wasn't successful and even though it was far away from where she disappeared. But there was a search done in early June of 2019 Two and a half months later, I'm inclined to believe that that search was fruitless. The next case I want to talk about very quickly is Devin Brown Busettis. I continue to be in contact with her aunt, Wilshire. Of all of the articles that I did with the Tribune Review last year, and of course that's not something that continued into 2019, unfortunately. I wish it had. But of all the articles that Stephen Huba wrote, and of course I found the people for him to talk to, I'm pretty certain that this is the article that had the most impact. And what's interesting, it's one of the last ones we did. In fact, it might have been 
the last one that came out in 2018 before my contract with them was over. Uh, Wilshire uh, continues to be in contact with Pittsburgh, Pol Pittsburgh police. Uh, I think that when she calls, they now take her phone calls. Whereas I think that the, she went for a very, very long time without talking to anybody there. And there have been some developments and some more people that she's talked to. A couple different names have popped up. And frankly, I think that it's caused me to look at the disappearance in a little bit of a different way. I'm not saying that uh, Devin's husband wasn't involved or anything, but it certainly has opened up some new possibilities. And just even recently, within the last 10 days, I think Wilshire uh, contacted me to tell me that she continues to talk to the police there, and I think it's uh, a very, very positive experience. And I think this is noteworthy because we have to remember that uh, that Devin was not, uh, she'd only been in Pittsburgh for a very short time. You have to remember that Wilshire uh, and Devin of the rest of her family, including Wilshire, do not live in uh, Pennsylvania. They actually live here in Florida, uh, actually over in the Orlando area. So to be able to get that communication going is certainly something. It's certainly noteworthy. And I, I really like what happened there, and I'm, I just feel bad that, that Stephen and I were not able to cause this to happen in more of the cases uh, that were covered last year in the Tribune Review. But definitely with Devin Brown Busetta's case, a lot of things have happened since that article came out at the end of last year, and I feel really good about that. Okay, now we move into the new cases. Everything that, every case that I've covered so far has been part, had the possibility of being in a former update episode. But now these are going to be all of the cases or updates of cases that have happened after the last update in April of 2019. So the first one I want to talk about is Travis Murrow's case. After... Uh, we did that episode. I actually got to talk to a radio show host in Oklahoma. His name is Jay Douglas, so J. Period Douglas, at K101, which comes uh, is out of a town not far from where Travis had disappeared. Uh, Jay had not heard about Travis's disappearance, unfortunately. In fact, the, the reason that Jay even contacted me in the first place was because of Tom Thomas Brown's disappearance uh, in that area of Oklahoma. It's very close to northern Texas, and of course, Canadian Texas is near Oklahoma. So that has been part of their discussion on their radio show in K at K101, Tom Brown's case. But then um, I got to talk to him about Travis's case, and I'm hoping that they've given Travis's disappearance some airtime, some attention since uh, Jay Douglas and I talked uh, back, I guess it must have been in May or something. Unfortunately, I'd offered to come on to the program, but what he told me was they, it's a very, very small radio station, and uh, technologically, if I were to come on for an hour and talk about Tom's case and Travis's case, there's commercials and, and everything else, and so we couldn't make that happen, unfortunately. But I would still like to make that happen if they could figure it out. I think that would be a good discussion uh, regarding both of those cases. But we got to talk about Travis's case, and it was good that I could let somebody in the media know uh, in that area about a disappearance that the people even there who live there didn't know about. Uh, Travis's uh, family continues. Uh, of course, his ex-wife, Christy, was my guest for that episode. She and other people continue to post in the Unfound Podcast discussion group about Travis's case. And I think we need to remember that this is still a relatively new case. In Unfound terms, it's still a relatively new case. Um, and the other point I'd like to bring up about uh Travis's disappearance is that it was, I think, one of the first cases where I actually used had to use YouTube 
to further discuss the case because you start getting into roads and directions and different routes that he could have driven and when, where his truck was found. It's hard to do that with just audio. So I had an accompanying video on YouTube for that case. Maybe that's news to some of you. If you don't know that, please go to the Unfound YouTube channel and you will find the video that I did regarding Travis's disappearance. And I kind of have the screen up, a Google map on my laptop up there and kind of diagramming everything. And it got a very, very good response. And I will continue to do that if I believe that a case warrants it, where it's really difficult maybe to understand what the, the, the guest is trying to explain, then I will go and make a video on YouTube so people can go there to further um, understand what happened. Because I think that had I just left it with the audio, anybody who's not right from that area of Oklahoma I think would have been uh, fairly confused, and I think it even gets more confusing if they're listening and maybe they have a their laptop up and trying to follow everything. I think that that would then lead people to maybe think things uh, that aren't necessarily true. They get confused about all the routes and everything. So I just did it myself, and I thought it got a very good response. The next case is Layla Faulkner's. First of all, you need to know that her boyfriend at the time, Blaine Growl here Jr., uh, lost his mind when the episode came out. He did not send me anything, but that's what I heard, first of all. Second of all, Layla's mother, Susan, contacted me maybe a month or something after the episode came out to tell me that Blaine, maybe even because of this episode coming out, he went and took another lie detector test regarding Layla's disappearance, and Susan was told that he failed it. I have no proof of that. I'm just telling you what Susan told me. Um, so that's the update. I think in Layla's case, a lot of different possibilities. I'm not as locked into any one possibility as I am in maybe some of the other cases that Unfound is covered. It's still open up. It's open to some interpretation of the facts. And of course, Layla herself was going through a lot of different things. And that's the way it is with these cases where drugs are involved or could be involved. But Blaine Growl here, Jr. lost his mind, and maybe it caused him to want to do a lie detector test again. He did it again, and he failed it again. That's the update. The next update I want to do is for Megan Lancaster's. I'm going to read something um, for the first time uh, on this episode, an article. This comes from the Daily Mail. Yep, you have to go to England to get good information sometimes on disappearances in cases that happen in the United States. And I'm, I'm laughing, but that just shows you sometimes the state of American media. But let me read this to you. This article came out on June 27, 2019, so approximately uh, a month and a half after Unfound covered Megan's disappearance. And I'll say something else as well. More than 2,700 cases could come under review after a retired judge in southern Ohio was accused of severe alcoholism and implicated in a prostitution ring. William T. Marshall retired as a Scioto County Common Pleas Court judge last year while facing a suspension after an ethics board found him he improperly meddled in his daughter's speeding ticket. I think that was something that I talked about with Megan's uh, sister-in-law, who was my guest for that episode. Uh, the article continues, Then earlier this year, Marshall's mother and daughter filed for guardianship over the former judge, arguing that Marshall was no longer able to take care of himself because of advanced alcoholism, the Cincinnati Inquirer reported. In the filing, the family stated Marshall showed up intoxicated for work as a judge and that his finances were in shambles. And so down, I'm going to skip some uh, paragraphs, and it says, uh, the report investigates, and then in March, Marshall was also named in a lengthy inquiry report on an alleged prostitution ring in Portsmouth, a small town, Ohio, a small Ohio town just across the Ohio River from Kentucky. The report investigates claims in a DEA affidavit that a Portsmouth defense attorney has for years pressured women into prostitution by telling them he could get lenient sentences from friendly judges. 
Defense attorney Michael Mirren, 73 years old, we of course talked about him in that episode, has not been criminally charged and repeatedly denied any allegation that he was involved in prostitution or sex trafficking. But the 80-page affidavit alleges that he is a prolific sex trafficker who supplied his young female clients with drugs in exchange for and as an incentive to participate in acts of prostitution. Some of the women say they were even sent as far as to New York, New Jersey, Louisiana, and Florida for paid sexual liaisons. The affidavit also refers to a Portsmouth judge in collusion with Mirren, alleging that Mirren provided the judge women, according to information obtained through numerous interviews, including interviews with former prostitutes. Um, So there you go. And it's a a much larger article. You can find it at dailymail.co.uk. And I think if you just go there and do a search for Portsmouth, you will find that article. And of course, because we don't plagiarize, I'm giving this article credit and I'm telling everywhere one where I got the information and I'm telling them to go to that website to check it out for themselves. So that's uh, the um, first thing that went on, big article that came out after uh, Unfound did its coverage for Megan's disappearance. The other, I don't, you know, I don't know if this is some sort of coincidence or what, but I'm just going to, I can, I think I can tell you the whole story. So I'm down at the gym one night. There is a gym in this building that I live in now. And I was down there and I get no cell phone service. This, this building must be made out of lead or something. I get no cell phone service. And even when I do interviews in my uh, place, I have to use Wi-Fi calling not the regular T-Mobile signal. But I'm down there, and so I have the TV on, so it's not total dead silence. And I'm watching a Law in Order episode. And the name of the episode, so you can check it out. I'm going to pause this recording for a second to uh, find out what episode it is. Pardon me. Okay, I'm back. It took me a while to try to find that episode. But coincidentally, conveniently, the title of the episode is Missing. Yes, you can't make this stuff up. It is from the regular first Law & Order, the, the one that started in 1990, and it is episode, it is season 12, episode 14. And a young woman goes missing. Of course, that's very rare in Law & Order cases because usually they start out every episode with uh, a dead body. But in this one, it starts out with a disappearance and the detectives have to track this woman down who she does end up being deceased. But uh, I don't want to ruin it for you. But this young woman who was murdered was seeing someone in a position of power. But she was not allowed to use this guy's name uh, in conversations or anything like that. And so I'm watching this episode as I'm working out, and I've seen virtually all of the Law & Order episodes, at least of not Criminal Intent, didn't get into it too much, S, uh, SVU, not SUV, SVU, didn't get into that too much, but I've seen all of the, what do they call it, Law & Order Prime? I've seen all of them. So I'm watching this episode while I'm working out and it gets to this part and this other woman who used to date uh, this guy who is a uh, a suspect in, in the disappearance and then murder of the woman in this episode, she says that, yes, this guy never want, allowed me to use his name uh, and any time that we talked or anything, I, I just had to call him by a letter. And the detectives ask her, what letter? And he goes, well, I just had to go and call him by the letter E. So A, B, C, D, E, like the beginning of my first name, Edward. I heard that. And I was like, did that just happen? Now, what does this have to do with Megan Lancaster's case? Well, if you will remember, Megan kept a little black book, a proverbial little black book of all of these men that she had contact with while she was doing drugs and and prostitution, etc. She kept a book. And 
it is now in the possession of her si uh, sister-in-law, who was the guest for that episode. And in that book, there was a guy whose name, the only person in that entire book who didn't have a real name, he had the letter E as his name. And there was a phone number there. Well, who did it end up being? It ended up being a, somebody high up, and I didn't write the guy's name down, but it ended up being somebody high up in the Portsmouth Police Department. And so I'm watching this episode, and I heard that, and of course this episode would have come out before, well before Megan ever disappeared. And... I, I had to wonder, did she see that episode and then decide to, get, to use that letter for this particular guy that she encountered from the police department in Portsmouth? And of course, this guy said that he never had any relationship with Megan, on and on and on. It, it's part of, a, of course, a, like I read, the, a very large corruption probe that is continuing to be ongoing there. But when I found this out, I certainly had to pass it on to the guest for the episode, who was Katie Lancaster, once again, Megan Lancaster's sister-in-law. And she, she also found that interesting, and I don't know what she's been able to do with that. I have to tell you that being that in that Law & Order episode, this girl who was murdered was using that letter to signify this guy in a powerful government position. I do not believe it's a coincidence that Megan also used the letter E to as a title for this guy in her little black book. I happen to believe that she saw that Law & Order episode and thought, yes, that's we probably shouldn't, I couldn't put this guy this high... How do I want to put this? Once again, I'm doing this off the top of my head. A guy in a very prominent position in the Portsmouth Police Department. She didn't want to put his name in the book, so she just wrote E instead. And I really, really believe she got it from this Law & Order episode. I know that sounds crazy, but given what was going on in that Law & Order episode and given what was going on with Megan, it makes a lot of sense. It really does. And so <clears throat> I urge you to hunt down that episode. It's called Missing. It's from the 12th season of Law & Order, and it is classified as episode 14 from that season. And you can check that out for yourself and let me know what you think. Just a few more to go. I think uh, we have three more to go. Monica Appleton. Unfortunately, uh, Donnie, her brother, who was the guest for that episode, he and I continue to be a little bit like ships passing in the night, but I've been wanting to pass on some information to him that, that a listener passed on to me, and it had to do with addresses that Monica used, uh, and, it, and it very well may be that there's something, and you know, anybody that uses databases online, whether you're paying for them or they're free, you know a lot of times they get stuff wrong. Sometimes phone numbers aren't current anymore. Addresses aren't current. Uh, if you're looking at some site that tries to put a person and all their relatives, you find out that a lot of those people aren't their relatives. And I've run into it. I know Emily has run into it. Other people who have tried to research things for me Sometimes the information is not as solid as you think. But this particular listener uh, sent some information to me saying that there might be proof that there were addresses that were being used in Monica's name after she disappeared. And I just haven't been able to talk to Donnie. I can't say any more uh, than that, I don't know if he knows about it, and I've been meaning to give him a call, and maybe I should give him a call after I'm done recording this episode. But, um, not sure what to think of it. It does sound suspicious, but on the other hand, I could easily believe that 
once again, these, these databases are not as solid and 100% true as everybody thinks, and it very well may be these were addresses that Monica used before she disappeared. But I'll talk to Donnie about it, and we'll see what he says. Next case, Jonathan Estes, and this is, of course, a very, very recent case. We're getting really close to the present. The bobcat that disappeared along with Jonathan uh, has been found. Uh, I've talked to Melissa, his sister, about it. Uh, the bobcat was found in an, an in a, another town, not the one in which Jonathan disappeared, about 45 uh, miles, 45 minutes away. And the way that she has described it to me, the way that she, what she's posted about, she's posted about it on Facebook, makes me believe that the guy who bought this bobcat from Jonathan's estranged wife has nothing to do with Jonathan's disappearance at all. Uh, is it still a little shady that, if you will remember, I think that they determined that the Bobcat itself uh, was worth like $10,000 or something like that, and Jonathan's wife sold it for only 4000 Now, how a person could get into a transaction like that knowing that they were getting such a good deal and not think it was at least a little suspicious, of course. Uh, it doesn't show much for that guy's character. I mean, if a deal is like too good, I mean, I have nothing against a great deal, a great discount on something, but when the discount is so much and the price is so under what the market value is, whether it's a car or a motorcycle or a piano or, or even a house, if the price is so far under the market value of what it should be, you have to be a little suspicious. Like a car, if it's way underpriced, well, maybe it has flood damage. With a house, maybe the reason is that, you know, you go into the basement and the, the, the walls of the basement are like falling in like was happening in my sister's old house that she used to live in the late 1990s. Um, of course... The person who bought it knew that was going on. But I'm not saying that my sister tried to rip somebody off. That's not the case. That just came to mind. But this that this guy would buy this bobcat that was in perfect running order for so much less doesn't paint him in the most positive of lights. But I'm not convinced this guy had anything to do about the disappearance. I don't think that he knew that the Bobcat could be connected to Jonathan's disappearance. I don't even know if this guy even knew about Jonathan's disappearance. But uh, when we covered Jonathan's disappearance about a month and a half ago, that was a big question. What did happen to it? Who did she sell it to? Uh, what does that mean? What did she do with the money and, and everything else? Well, that uh, answer has been gotten. And, of course, we're hoping that that leads to even more uh, questions being answered regarding Jonathan's disappearance. Unfortunately, uh, in Jonathan's case, you can't ignore the, the possibility that there might be law enforcement involvement. I'm not saying an entire department, but I'm saying maybe one or two officers could have been involved. And if you don't know what that means, I urge you to go and listen to that episode for yourself. But the Bobcat has been found. And I'm guessing it's going to be returned to its rightful owner, who I understand is Jonathan and Melissa's father. Last case we're going to cover, and this, of course, brings us right up to uh, the present, is Kamisha Hollis's disappearance from just a few weeks ago. There's still no trial updates. You know that her husband, uh, Marvin Young, Technically, I guess they weren't married, but they'd lived together for many, many years, had three kids together. Um, he is still in custody. I don't haven't heard anything about a trial. Uh, I don't know if he's going to plead guilty. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I know that there have been searching. There's been some searches that were done uh, in a particular area just north uh, from where she disappeared. If you will remember that there was a cell phone ping from that case over in Kansas, but the concentration seems to be in a river area just north of where Kamisha disappeared, maybe a half hour north of there 
and they're looking for that at that area for some reason. I'm guessing it's because Marvin's phone pinged in that area for quite a while that that morning uh, that Kamisha disappeared. And I also updated, see, if you'll remember, when we did the episode, we didn't have a lot of information, and there was going to be, knew that Marvin uh, Young was in custody, and there was going to be some sort of hearing, and and at the time, I was thinking, you know what, the prosecutor better have a lot more, if you can go back and listen to that episode. I was saying in my summation that the prosecutor better have a lot more than we know if they want to try to prove that Marvin murdered Kamisha. Well, what happened when that hearing happened, there certainly is a lot more. Certainly, certainly. And Caprice, Kamisha's uh, sister, was there to hear it all. And uh, there's certainly a lot more. And I think that there, in a YouTube live show that I did, live show I did right after this hearing w- was uh, completed, that I talked about, that they, that they had him on camera with a plastic bag that he also had when he he ditched Kamisha's uh, vehicle so there it sounds to me that still it's all circumstantial but it sounds to me though that they have very strong circumstantial case against Marvin Young I think what also came out that there was blood found in the house that was a big question that uh, when I interviewed Caprice Regarding all of that, if you remember that her mother went over there and police were there and they did not allow her to go entirely through the house, but she didn't personally see any blood. Well, it must be that they must have kept her maybe downstairs or just in one room. The police went in in the rest of the house and they did see that there were uh, signs of violence. Not, I'm not saying it was blood and blood splattered everywhere, but I think it was enough to let them know that, yes, something uh, of a violent nature did happen, something that could have caused Kamisha to die. And so that's why I think they finally decided to charge Marvin Young with her murder, and it seems they are in a fairly solid base to do so, but it still seems that a lot of it is circumstantial, but it's certainly a stronger case than when I interviewed um, Caprice for the episode just a month ago. And that completes the updates of Unfound's cases starting at the beginning in September 2016 and taking you right up to the present here in early September of 2019. And now if you could pause whatever you are doing for an extended moment of silence as I read off all the missing people featured on Unfound. Suzanne Lyle, Jason Jolkowski, Jesse Foster, Rosemarie Gayhart, Ben Padilla, Kelly Rothwell, Joshua Guimond, Donnie Smatlack, Andrea Bowman, Robin Abrams, Regina Marie Boss, Christopher Hyde, Jeff Nichols, Rebecca Gary, James Walker, Teresa Butler, Charlotte Paulus, Lola Catherine Fry, Eric Franks, Jeff Joseph, Donna Michalenko, Dave Madot, Kent Monroe, and Omar Shearer, Claudia Wells, Peggy and Patty McDaniel, Shannon Turner, Brandy Wells, Clashindra Hall, Ronnie Russell, Esther Westenbarger, Shane Fell, Ashley Eifert, Brandon Williams, Craig Freer, Pamela Golden, Chip Campbell, Amanda DeGuio, the passengers and crew of Flight 370, April Pitzer, Jennifer Wilkerson, Kent Jacobs, Aaron Gilbert, Tammy Leppert, Crystal Morrison, Chris Turner, Linda K. Carroll, Nikki McCown, Helen Diamond, Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman, Lucindy Hules, Ashley Kohler, Debbie Lowe, Patrick Beavers, Clinton Nelson, Troy Galloway, Patty Action, Danielle Bell, 
Evelyn Hartley, Dal Phillips, Tyler Stice, Bill Underhill, Patty Taylor, Aaron Barnard, Jeremy Burt, Brian Sullivan, Nikki Wells, Marina Bolter, Mandy Stokes, Greg Brooks, Rebecca Henderson, Dominique Holly Grisham, Tiffany Daniels, Nicholas Masucci, Donald Irwin, Billy D. Silvestro, Renee Yergain, Mikkel Biggs, Al Copper, J.R. Mollahan, Jamie Bowen, Travis Robertson, Rosemary Rapp, Kristen Modafferi, Zoe Campos, Sean Ginyard, Thomas Brown, Amanda Fravel, Julie Early, Ellen Sloan, Renee Lamana, Nico Lisi, Leah Peebles, Melissa Hasley, Kimberly Raymer, Stephen Kocher, Bonnie Joseph, Immaculate Basil, Bobby Campbell, Kimberly Norwood, Alyssa Turney, Bobby Tennyson, Dale Kerstetter, Lacey Buenfil, Peggy McGuire, Jansen Brewer and Daniel Braden, Robert Cox, Lucas Degerness, Stephen Adams, Ashley Summers, Bonnie and Jeremy Degas, Judith Emke, Jessica Hamby, Tim Beauchart, Devin Bond, Juanita Nelson, Desiree Ferris, Angie Arnell, Deborah Asbury, Sean Kosky, Mary Lands, Devin Brown Busetta, Shanna Boydo, Travis Murrow, Keith Fetter, Layla Faulkner, Megan Lancaster, Kelly Sims, Jack Hemby, Barbara Frame, Dorianne Myers, Austin Pivo, Christine Hamilton, Monica Appleton, Jonathan Estes, Molly Miller and Colt Haynes, Donnie Martin III, Kamisha Hollis, Lisa Wallace, Tammy McKittrick, Julie C., Stephanie Clemens, Andy Chapman, Trevor Nichols. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.